I'm going to call to order this meeting of the Monroe um, County Board of Commissioners. It is September 29th, 2021, and we'll begin with our public statement. We, the Monroe County Board of Commissioners, renew our commitment to welcome and protect the rights of all people, regardless of age, race, color, creed, disability, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, marital status, economic status, and national origin. And we affirm the right of every person to live peacefully and without fear. And we will fight and resist at every step, discrimination and harmful policies, whatever their source. We also stand in support of our county public school systems, both RBB and MCCSC. And with that, I will note uh, for the record that all three members of the board are present. And we will begin with our department updates. And first from the health department, we have Ms. Cole. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for allow allowing me to come again this morning. Today, I have a little bit of a mix of good and bad or not so good news, but we will, we will get started. The bad news on that front, we do continue to see deaths occur from COVID-19. So anyone paying attention to that dashboard will see that people are continuing to die. Vaccination rates in our county, while improving, are still less than 60% fully vaccinated. Uh, yesterday, we were at 59.9%. So we are getting close, finally, to that 60% mark, but that is not near high enough. So we still need people to get vaccinated. We have a ways to go. The metrics advisory, we will remain in orange again this week. However, I do have some good news on that front. Our percent positivity dropped below 5% this week. We are one of two counties that will see their percent positivity lower than 5%, and that is Monroe County and Tippecanoe. Uh, our cases per 100,000 will also be under 200 this week. So that those are improvements. Uh, remember that we have to stay in a particular category for two weeks to show an ongoing trend before you can uh, move lower. So our, our layered approach that we have been taking of masking, um, everyone should be masked indoors and in public places uh, during high transmission times. So 50 or higher per 100,000 is considered high transmission. We need to continue to vaccinate everybody who's eligible. So 12 and over are eligible for vaccination. Please get vaccinated. And then continuing those standard things that we talk about every year, COVID or not, hand washing, staying home when you're sick, um, you know, all of those things. So isolation and quarantine um, are still very, very important. And those are the steps that it will take to move us forward and get out of this pandemic. The Indiana Department of Health has made some changes to their dashboard. Uh, it will now be updated every day at 5 p.m. instead of noon. And that is just because of the depth of information and trying to make sure that everything is accurate uh, when it's posted. So that is pushed back. Um, there are still some things that are updated weekly, uh, but they continue to add new information to that dashboard. So I would encourage people to pay attention to that. As far as testing, the Indiana Department of Health and Gravity Diagnostics site did open last week, did have a few hiccups. It opened with uh, some rainy days, uh, but they are working through all of those things. It is open Tuesday through Saturday, 8 to 4 p.m. at 500 North Profile Parkway. Now they will be moving indoors at some point, uh, but they are have that drive through right now so that we can have testing available uh, while they are finding a good indoor location. And again, you can go on that state's website and you can find all of your testing options, all of your vaccination options. So I encourage you to use that. And the last thing that I will say is we are embarking on influenza season. 
get your flu shot. And you can get your flu shot along with your COVID-19 vaccination if you have not received that yet as well. Or if you're uh, one of the people who uh, is getting that booster shot, you can get that and your flu vaccine at the same time. So I would encourage you to do that. You know, last year we had almost no flu season because we had all of these measures in place to protect us. So we would encourage you to continue all of the prevention practices that we know help spread these infections. That's it. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Carl. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Well, I am very proud that Monroe County is doing so well in terms of the state as a whole. It's just really sad that we can't do even better. Um, hopefully people will get out and get vaccinated. Um, Commissioner Gibbons? Um, yeah, is there any update on when uh, children five through 11 might be eligible for vaccination? No specific dates. I believe the last I heard is that is supposed to be submitted um, early October. So it could come as a decision could come as early as the end of October. Um, but I think that would be the earliest. Thank you. And uh, thank you for all your hard work and uh, your board's hard work. And of course, Dr. Sharp and um, everyone on staff who really just focuses on keeping us protected all the time. And we can't thank you enough for that dedication. So thank you so much. All right. Um, Let's next go to emergency management. Ms. Petroline, good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, Monroe County people. <laughs> and then the office became one. So <laughs> it's still, the duties are still the same. The daily operations are still the same. So hopefully uh, we have a second person come in soon. But until then, um, I'll just keep it brief and give you our uh, regular updates. So right now we have blood drives scheduled for October 21st. 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. and October 22nd, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Those are both going to be at the Southeast YMCA. You can sign up for those blood drives by going onto our website at co.monroe.in.us. And if you actually click on the date, it will take you directly to the Red Cross website and you can sign up for those. Uh, secondly, just always want to remind everyone, if you haven't already, please sign up for those county alerts. Not only do you get notification of different weather events, but travel advisories in respect of the winter coming. And then also any type of uh, COVID related updates for the county, if testing sites would become available and or if they would close for some weather reason um, that you would receive those on um, receiving those county alerts. You can do that by going onto the main page and clicking on that megaphone. And last but not least, I know Allison has covered a lot of preparedness tips throughout this month, but there are still, what, two days left in September. So I'm still gonna respect the fact that we're in National Preparedness Month. And I'm just gonna do a, a quick recap of just three things we really wanna make sure citizens are aware of and should be working on is that first we wanna promote people to make a plan, whether it be at your work or at your household. And just remember to kind of look at the plans in different ways according to the hazard. So you're going to respond to a flooding event at your home differently than you would at a tornado or a fire. So just keep those things in mind when you're creating a plan. Uh, secondly, we encourage citizens to build a kit. Uh, Make sure you put in at least three days worth of food and water, and not only for you and the humans in your household, but also the pets. And also keep in mind, maybe you wanna put copies of your driver's license in there or important documents that just in case those things would um, disappear during a hazard, uh, you have those in that kit. And last but not least, I just talked about it, be informed, sign up for those county alerts, get that weather radio. And uh, you can be uh, on top of all the information that's coming at you and uh, be as accurately informed as possible. And that is all I have for updates today. 
thank you for having me. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Petroline. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Well, I'd like to welcome you in your new role of acting director. I feel <laughs> confident that you have the experience and the knowledge to keep things going the way they need to be. And uh, we will support you in whatever way is needed. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much. Thank you. Commissioner Gittins? Yeah, I just wanted to say last week when I was out at the goodbye party for Allison Moore that I got to meet a couple of the other emergency management directors in the area. And it was amazing to me how close you all are uh, and how much you work together, how you have each other's backs. And that is very reassuring because nothing really impacts just one county unless it's a, a odd tornado. But um, yeah, it, it's really nice to see that you have that, that kind of, I don't know, network in place. I'm glad you got to see that. Not many people see that. And um, it is very important. We have to have each other's backs. We are a team. Absolutely. So uh, I'm very happy with the relationships that we have here in District 8 because we're very close. So, yeah. Excellent. And um, thank you for uh, stepping in. And um, I know that Ms. Moore was a fantastic mentor and um, we are uh, thoroughly um, uh, committed and, and um, supportive of your, of your work. So thank you for, for that. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Great. And next we have an update from Highway from Ms. Ridge. Good morning. Uh, we are doing our typical of paving and patching and uh, mowing and uh, very busy uh, trying to wrap up the end of a construction season. Uh, we do have some utility companies doing some a lot of work over at Curry Pike, Smith Pike, Woodyard Road intersection so we can get that completed before the winter so we can do the construction of the roundabouts next year. So I would avoid that area if uh, at all possible. Um, other than that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, again, anytime a citizen has something they'd like to report, they can go um, onto our website at www.co.monroe.in.us and complete that form. Uh, and it will come straight to us for an investigation. Um, also, you can always call the department at 812-825-5355. Excellent. Thank you so much. Comments, questions? Commissioner Jones? I'm just very pleased to see work beginning on that roundabout. It's uh, been needed for a while, and it'll be a really good thing when it's completed. Yeah, it's a great project. <clears throat> it is. Commissioner Gittins? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say. I'm thinking about that, that roundabout, because that whole kind of five-way intersection is really dangerous. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and oh, I know. Uh, I did have a constituent that contacted me about potholes and stuff, and so it was very easy for me to go on to the website, find the phone number, find you know where the form was and direct them to that. So um, I appreciate that that's available to people. Great. Yeah, and uh, we appreciate your hard work. Thank you so much. Um, and next we have uh, planning, um, Ms. Nestor Jellin. Good, Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Thanks for having me this morning. Uh, just wanted to give you a quick update that um, tomorrow, September 30th, we're going to be hosting a virtual meeting for the County Development Ordinance. This is to complement the in-person meetings we had at County Park Shelters earlier in the month. So for those of you that wish to attend remotely, this is your opportunity. At this meeting, we're going to be looking at the draft zoning map, as well as a list of the current permitted uses in people's current zones. And we've had a productive conversation with many of the people we've been able to uh, have meetings with thus far. So uh, the meeting tomorrow, September 30th, it's starting at 5.30 and we have it open until 7.30. With the assistance of tech services, we're going to be uh, putting people into breakout rooms to hopefully give a little bit more of a one on one approach to people that are able to meet with us. And that's pretty much the same format that was at the in person shelter meeting. So, again, that's uh, Thursday, September 30th, 5 30 to 7 30 via Zoom. 
The Zoom link can be found on our MonroeCDO.com website, or you can go to the county website, co.monroe.in.us, and hit the events calendar, and all the information is there. If anyone has any questions, they can give us a call, 812-349-2560. And then lastly, just a recommendation that if you are joining us via Zoom, please uh, join with the device if you can. Um, that you can read materials presented on the screen. And if you have any issues doing that, again, our, our phone number or our email, I'll give that as well. Um, Planning office at co.monroe.in.us. If you want to um, meet with us individually after the meeting, we're, we're happy to do that as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? No, I just highly recommend that anyone who hasn't already taken a look at this attend one of these meetings and find out exactly what's going to be happening. Commissioner Giffins? Yeah, having observed um, one of the in-person meetings, I was very pleased at how your staff work with individuals with all their questions and um, were very thorough. So thank you. Yeah. This is um, such a great idea. It's almost like a pre-feedback session uh, um, before the Planning Commission has even seen this um, to, to discuss it and, and deliberate over it. So it's really good to get um, residents' input uh, in advance. Um, um, so their suggestions can be incorporated um, and heard early on in the process. And they'll have another opportunity as well later. So excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have an update from Mr. Evans. Technical services, good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, just a quick note for you guys on Friday starts not just the spooky season, but it is also cybersecurity awareness month, just like September was national preparedness month. We are passing that along to cybersecurity awareness. Uh, and, and this is a really important topic. I don't have to tell you guys that. Uh, I've got a number of events planned. Uh, I will be visiting you at each of the commissioner meetings for a three minute segment on things to be aware of with cybersecurity. That's not only germane to the staff here at the county, but it's also gonna be just as useful for uh, people in the public. Uh, and we'll highlight things that, uh, that are happening on a daily basis, people are getting caught up with and losing money on. So I, I think it'll be a fairly valuable thing. I'm also gonna have a lunch and learn towards the end of the month uh, uh, that I'm gonna host in the newly remodeled Nat Hill Room. Uh, we will broadcast it from there. I will compile all of these so that uh, people in Monroe, the, the staff of Monroe County can uh, can watch it at their leisure if they don't happen to uh, make all the commissioner meetings. You know, uh, I will basically just extract the the three minute segment. They will miss the pomp and circumstance of the board of commissioner meeting, but uh, you know, I can't recreate that in a non live environment. Anyway, uh, point being, everyone will have access to that. And from a retention standpoint, I'm going to have a bit of a, a cipher or a puzzle built into it. And the person uh, who is able to solve the puzzle will get a valuable prize, $50 gift card to Amazon and a trophy that they can display in their office. It'll be a moment of pride for all of us. So that's going on in October. Uh, and you can look forward to that at the next commissioner meeting. Sounds great. <laughs> thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? No, I don't. Just thank you. I'm looking forward to the advice. I think it's something I probably need. <laughs> Commissioner Giffins? Yeah, uh, Mr. Evans, you could add a little pomp and circumstance with your, your trumpet, couldn't you? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could. I could. But I don't know that I will. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. We look forward to that. Uh, let's see if there's any other, um, are there any other department heads who wish to uh, offer 
uh, an update. I do not see any. Uh, so with that, we will move on to uh, public comment. Uh, public comment is the time reserved for the public to offer commentary on anything that is not on our agenda. And you will have three minutes to offer um, your words of wisdom. And at two minutes and 30 seconds, uh, you will hear a tone. And when you hear that tone, that means you have 30 seconds to wrap up your, your thoughts. This is uh, this three minute time limit also applies to uh, items on our <clears throat> regular agenda as well. And so with that, it uh, looks like we have a couple of hands raised. Uh, first, we have um, Alice. Can you give us your full name, please? Okay, can you hear me now? I'm trying to unmute. Yes, we can hear you now. Can you give us your full name, please? Yes, Alice Hawkins, and I live on Will Souders Road, so I'm a county resident. And I have some exciting ideas to propose to you and to developers. And that is why don't we put Monroe County on the map by being extremely green. I understand that the, de that the developers and other people uh, are interested in being green and they talk about the bikes and they talk about helping with flooding, but this could really be exciting. Instead of having impervious roadways, let's have pervious roadways. Again, this could be advertised to the hilt. Uh, metal roofs on the house, houses, solar panels, tankless water heaters. Uh, that's just clotheslines being allowed. I'd like to see that the uh, new developments and that the new ordinances really promote this and it could be quite beneficial to absolutely everybody, not to mention the, the, the uh, country and, and uh, climate concerns. My second uh, situation here is I'd like to ask some questions of the most current proposal on the trails. Um, they've changed, it seems to me, the, uh, Ms. the Ms. Hawkins, amount. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, that is an item on our agenda. Oh, okay. And while right. your initial comments were general and great, um, we would ask that you hold your comments related to that agenda item for later Perfect. in uh, the meeting, if, if that's okay with you, Absolutely. I hope you can stay and with us. I do us. have one question about the previous meeting. Sure. Uh, d does the uh, planning committee have a list of definitions for the new designations for the how the the, uh, the county's proposing being zoned? Yeah, Can that I mean, is, yeah. yeah, that is, oh, there we go, Ms. Vanessa Shelton. <laughs> there we go, the answer to your question. Sure, thanks, Alice. So the um, meetings that we're having right now are ahead of an actual proposal of module two. So we're hoping to get the feedback incorporated early from the public and put that into module two. With module two coming out, uh, that will probably be happening in, in November at this point to the public, that will have definitions for each zone. So if you're able to attend the meetings, we will be able to explain a little bit more in depth. But at this point for those proposed zones, you will not be able to find exact definitions because we haven't released module two yet. We're just gathering input. Okay, I'm not sure how we're supposed to understand what you're proposing without understanding what the what what you're proposing. <laughs> sure, Alice, I'm happy. I think I have your email address, Alice, and I would like to follow up with you and maybe go over a particular parcel of interest and kind of explain a little bit what we're talking about these in person meetings because it might clarify things. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Jim Shelton. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Hi, Jim Shelton with the chamber. Here to remind the public again that CASA's fall training is uh, fast coming up on us. It's going to start October 18th and run through November 10th. So applications, uh, if you're considering this need to be uh, turned in pretty much right about now. Uh, the, the trainings will be Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday 
evenings uh, from 5.30 to 8.30. It is still up in the air as to whether they will be in person or via Zoom. The uh, applications can be found on the uh, CASA website, MonroeCountyCASA.org. Click on the volunteer link. You can actually fill the application out right online. And then you would, could expect to be interviewed by the staff and uh, then the training, I said, as I said, will start the uh, 18th. Once the training is over, you would be sworn in as an officer of the court by Judge Galvin and Judge Harvey. And then uh, you would be offered a choice of cases and you can uh, pick the one that seems to work best for you. And uh, you would work the case with one of the CASA staff. So you're not out there all by yourself. If you have questions about issues, the staff's very experienced and will help you with that. And uh, you would work toward hopefully reuniting the children with their parents, but more mostly you want to get them in a permanent uh, arrangement as soon as you can. Sadly to say that probably will take two years for each case. So they ask that if you are considering to be a CASA, please be uh, mindful that we would need you to commit for two years because we try to avoid turnover on cases. CASAs uh, are out of the a second set of eyes and ears for the court that will have met the judge, either Galvin or Harvey, have more info on what's going on. And they are just advocating for the children. DCS has to worry about uh, all the rules and whatever uh, bureaucratic things are going on at this time, which changes because it's part of our political system. And uh, the CASA doesn't have to do anything except worry about what's the best thing for the children. So. It's a wonderful volunteer opportunity, very fulfilling. I have a case that's hopefully gonna end this week uh, with the children uh, being, well, with the little four and a half year old guy being reunited with his parents who have really turned their lives around. And it's wonderful to be part of it and uh, see this child's story be changed. So thank you for the opportunity to spread that word to the public. And if you know somebody who you think would be a good counselor, please uh, tell them this too. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, just a reminder that um, uh, comments are um, not to be on um, an agenda item. Public comment in this time period is for items that are not on our agenda. Um, and next we have uh, Julie Hardesty. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Hi. Good morning. Um, would like to comment to ask that the commissioners support the Monroe County Clerk's recommendations regarding expanding space at Election Central for voter services in the Johnson Hardware Building. I've been uh, voting early downtown for as long as it's been available at my current residence, and that's about at least 15 years. Uh, I use Election Central for early voting precisely to avoid lines and because I can vote on my way into work. Uh, this works for primaries and for general elections. And that was exponentially not the case in October last year when I waited in line for over an hour to vote and it was still three weeks before election day. So the impact of voter inconvenience is voter suppression. Um, the clerk has made recommendations to help the situation and the bipartisan election board supports those recommendations. That's important to note because regardless of the other building options that have been suggested, those options do not have the support of the bipartisan election board. And so they're not options. Expanding the space available for voter services inside Election Central at the Johnson Hardware Building is what needs to happen. The space is there and the commissioners have the ability to make it work. If other services need to move, there are several building options that have been suggested and those other services do not require agreement from a bipartisan board. The clerk is responsible for running secure and fair elections and the election board ensures that the parties involved in the elections are in agreement. The commissioners support the space needs for elections, so please use your control over facilities to support the election board approved recommendations of the Monroe County clerk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have somebody, uh, so it looks like Alice has her hand raised, but we've already heard from Alice, so we can't uh, hear from her again, but if that's the same person. Um, and then we have uh, somebody with the screen name A-U-A-F-R-E-E-M. And I don't know if, um, 
I, we will need your name, please. Looks like they're not there anymore. All right. So um, let's see if there's any other um, public comments. I do not see any. So with that, um, we will move on to our next agenda item. Um, and that is item five. Please. Move approval of the minutes for September 22nd, 2021. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Any comments or questions? No. I sent one um, correction. It's already been taken care of. So appreciate that. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Cocker, will you please call the roll on approval of minutes September 22nd, 2021? Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Githens? Yes. Motion is approved. Three to zero. Thank you so much. Next item, please. Move approval of the claims docket, accounts payable September 29th, 2021. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Uh, Mr. Miller, will you tell us all about it, please? Of course. Good morning, commissioners. And as always, thanks for having me. Uh, the total for claims was 1,386,000. $857.34, $382,923.26 was for in-key tax collection distribution for September, $270,598.36 was for riverboat distribution for September, $159,000 was for Regions Bank for the quarterly convention center payment, and finally, uh, as far as notable claims are concerned, $97,046 uh, was spent for John Jones Chrysler Dodge Jeep for two Dodge Durangos for our Sheriff's Department. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mr. Miller. Uh, comments, questions? Commissioner Jones? No, I don't. Commissioner Giffins? No, I, I keep learning new things, things like the, the riverboat. <laughs> <laughs> Texas. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Let's see if there's any public comment on the claims. Just raise your hand in the uh, Zoom screen. I think we still have a hand raised, but I don't think it was about the claims. All left over. Okay. Okay. Um, with that, um, <clears throat> Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on accounts payable September 29th, 2021? Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Giffins? Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. And I will note for the record that we have received a report from the clerk of the circuit court. And that is the report for August of 2021. Um, and with that, we will move on to new business. Move to approve team alert cloud-based security software agreement. Fund name, cumulative capital, fund number 1138 in the amount of $1,275 up front and $1,200 monthly. Second. We have a motion and a second, and we have Ms. Petroline here to tell us all about it. Good morning again. Good morning again. I'm here just to uh, t start talking again about the team alert. I know that it was presented to uh, the commissioners at the work session last week. And I don't want to dig too deep, too far into the details of the functionality of what this application can do for us, as I know that that was discussed in detail 
at that work session. But I will give a quick recap of what it is. It is essentially a panic button system. Uh, the Team Alert software allows Monroe County government employees to send or receive alerts if they're in a threatening situation. And threatening situation can be anything of an, an irate uh, customer coming in and or if there is an active assailant. And it also allows for quick communication within those government walls. So therefore, if something would happen, let's say the courthouse uh, right up at the front doors, if someone hits that button on their phone, they can activate that alert system for the whole courthouse all the way up through the third floor, letting everyone know what's going on. Um, I'm bringing this to your attention today with the approval of the purchase. I know that that amount was discussed a little bit in detail at the work session, but I had a conversation with the customer service representative, Mr. Profeta, last night about a little more detail of that. So initially, we would be paying upfront the $1,275. There is a $75 activation fee. And then after that monthly, we would be charged $1,200 a month. That is according to user amounts. And this is not a contract agreement. So we can essentially um, stop using this service at any time if we wish to choose. I did ask him if that uh, monetary number stays the same since this is not considered a contract. And he said, whatever we go in initially as, uh, is our locked in amount. And that amount not only gives us the ability to use this software program, but it also gives us access to a team of technicians that will help us uh, navigate the system as well as help train all of our employees in the beginning. So I know that we have had collaboration, this office with Eric and Angie, and if they need to add anything, please do. But as for the information that I have, that's what I have. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like uh, maybe Mr. Evans has something to add. Yeah, I just wanted to say, as part of this whole deal, uh, I did some due diligence and followed up with customers of the company. Uh, it seems like a real good deal to me. Um, it, it, it'll allow us uh, an extreme amount of flexibility, but it'll also uh, get us taken care of in a fairly vital function uh, around the county. Um, the one thing that uh, I wanted to add on it is we do have a couple panic button systems in place already. Uh, in particular, the Justice Building has a, has a fairly elaborate panic button system. Uh, the system that we're talking about here with you guys today uh, is not meant at this time to replace the panic button system in the Justice Building. At some point in the future, we'll probably take a look at that. Uh, but again, the, the Justice Building with the courts and the judges and the clerk and the prosecutor's office, they have a kind of specialized need and, 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 and they, we, we have a we, we regularly test that system. We regularly replace the batteries. I mean, it's a whole elaborate thing. So to the extent with which any of them are watching this, wondering if we're gonna be replacing their system right away, that is not uh, what our plan is. That's a great point. Uh, thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, I'd like to thank Emergency Management and Mr. Evans from TSD for putting this together. It, will hopefully make our employees feel quite a bit more secure in their workspace, which is always a very desirable thing. Um, I'm sure there will be a little bit of a learning curve going with it, which can always be somewhat painful. But um, once we get through it, I think the county will be a more secure and better place to work. Thank you. Commissioner Giffins? Yeah, I just echo what Commissioner Jones said, but also right now we have people working a lot more from home, which means that there are fewer people in the office. And anytime there are fewer people, you have less folks around to come to your assistance. So I think this is a, a really good move. Yeah. 
Um, and I think this is um, one of those things that um, we're going to be glad to have and hope we never need it. <laughs> and uh, but it's nice to have it, right? I mean, and, and so I, I think this is going to be a great um, leap forward in protecting our employees. Um, all right, uh, let's see if there's any public comment um, on this item. Still have, all right. All right, um, I don't see any um, public commenters. Um, and so with that, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on the Team Alert Cloud-Based Security Software Agreement? Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Githens? Yes. Motion is approved, three to zero. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next item, please. Move to approve the health regulation extension. Second. We have a motion and a second, and we have Ms. Cottle joining us again. Good morning again. Good morning again. So last week, the Board of Health met to review the current regulation regarding COVID-19, so our mask regulations. Uh, that current regulation is set to expire tomorrow evening. So the board met last week to look at the data, what our status was as a community. They did take public comment and they had a robust discussion about uh, potential changes, concerns people had, that kind of information. Uh, we looked at where we were. As I mentioned earlier, we are still in a level of high transmission. Things are better today than they were last week. Um, but nonetheless, we still have a high level of transmission. As we kind of look ahead, we would estimate that, that the earliest that we could meet that getting into blue with less than 50 cases per 100,000, probably the best we can hope for is around October 20th. So the board, after much discussion, voted and approved extending the current regulation in its current form through October 31st. And that would leave uh, it, the factors for uh, the expiration would mean it would be set to expire October 31st, essentially at midnight, or by further action of the board uh, they decided to rescind it if they wanted to extend it again. And of course, then it would have to come back to you or if they decided that they wanted to make some changes. The blue advisory, so there is an automatic rescension. If we were to have cases fall below 50 per 100,000 and be a, in a state advisory color of blue then that would automatically rescind. So that is uh, what we are bringing forth to you and requesting approval for today. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for all of that detailed information. Um, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? I'd like to thank you and the health board and Dr. Sharp and your staff for all of your efforts to keep our community healthy and working properly, which it's hard to do during an, a pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Gittins? Yeah, I, I remain convinced that one of the reasons that our county is healthier is because of this mask mandate. And so I really appreciate everybody's work on this and um, just encourage everybody to get vaccinated and to wear their masks. I, even though I'm fully vaccinated, I continue to wear my mask whenever I'm out. Yeah, that's a great point. It is important to uh, to keep wearing our masks. And sometimes if um, you look like you're the odd county out, but you're doing the right thing, it's okay, you know? <laughs> um, and um, I, I really appreciate all the hard work. I attended that. 
um, health board meeting, just whenever I can, I just like to listen in. And there was some really great discussion and some, some suggestions from community members about different things. And um, I think it was, it's really always a good learning experience. And I appreciate the way that the board um, contemplates um, a whole range of situations that are, that are brought to it. So um, really amazing work and, and um, it's great. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, let's see if there's any public comment on this particular item. And Ms. Dayton, I'm gonna assume that the um, hand that's been raised um, all pretty much all morning is, is just a fluke. And I'm gonna say, let's go to uh, Greg Alexander. Great. Um, thanks. My name is Greg Alexander. I'm not going to give you too many facts to try to persuade you. I just want to say I don't like wearing a mask. It, it harms me. It harms the groups I participate in. It harms my kids. Uh, when all this started last March, my oldest was seven years old. Now he's nine. Uh, we're social creatures. Socializing through a mask or through a computer is inferior. I mean, there's no, no real two ways to look at that. This is his only childhood. 18 months ago, we were all locking down to buy time to develop a vaccine. Against all odds, there's a decently effective vaccine. I've been vaccinated for five months now. What are we waiting for today? Do you really believe COVID will go away if we just hide long enough? Yeah, we have less cases now, but someday we will have to unmask. We'll have to end all the lockdowns, and then we'll still be a vulnerable population to be exposed to, to COVID. We just have to go through that. Nobody's getting a free ride out of this. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate your comments. Let's see if there's um, anyone else who wishes to make a comment. And it looks like there aren't any other commenters. And so with that, uh, Mr. Cocker, will you please call the roll on the health regulation extension? Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Githens. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Thank you. I will let the board know. Thank you. All right. Next item, please. Move to approve an amendment of Trailhead Enterprises, Inc. regarding food and beverage grant fund. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. And Mr. Cockrell's camera has got a little funny thing in front of it. <laughs> Is that a cover? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Yeah, and I, you know when I when I put this agenda item and was working through the issue with Trailhead, it just kind of I wanted to kind of express kind of it shows the evolution of the the county's response to uh, the COVID nineteen. Uh, the agreement we were we are amending would be one that was issued in at the end of June of last year. At that point in time, uh, to the to the businesses in the community was solely around food and beverage um, grant funds. And so, you know, at that time, we had been giving it for uh, employee support, supplier payments, thing, rent assistance, things like that. Um, and we got one that was for a new HVAC system. Um, and that was something that had, we hadn't contemplated before. So the, the solution was, yeah, we'll go ahead and fund it, but then you'll have to repay us back. Um, again, as it evolved, we had more requests for that. We had the, the other funding sources and we paid for these kind of things without requiring a payback. Um, so when we, when he reached back out to us, um, I think working with Bree, just confirming that this was something we would have paid totally for and not required a payback later in the year, uh, it made sense to amend this agreement so that that repayment provision was removed um, for that purpose. Great, thank you so much. Uh, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, this is just a very fair thing to do. Um, since others got their HVAC free, I would feel very uncomfortable asking Trailhead to pay us back for theirs. Well, they didn't get it for free, they got it with a grant. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, last, last week, um, one of Mr. Cockrell's colleagues, um, Ms. Rice, had us participating in a sort of statewide 
forum talking about our response to COVID. And it seems that we were one of probably the only county in the state that made these kinds of grants available to people to keep businesses going, to keep people housed, um, fed, all the things that we need to do to have a, a healthy and prosperous uh, county. So I, it, it is good to look back, I think. And I'm really pleased that, that we're able to, to sort of make this adjustment. Great. Um, I agree and um, so grateful for my colleagues and so grateful for the legal department for helping us through this whole thing. Um, as much as we relied on the health department uh, to get us through the pandemic um, with their great guidance and the emergency management with their great support, it's, um, we've had to navigate a lot of very new things, new processes, new ways of doing things. And, and so we appreciate your hard work uh, work of Ms. Rice and others on the staff. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, let's see if there's any public comments on this particular item. I do not see any. So with that, Mr. Copper, will you please call the roll on the amendment of Trailhead Enterprises Inc. regarding the Food and Beverage Grant Fund. Commissioner Thomas. Commissioner yes. Jones. Yes. Commissioner Githens. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, next item, please. Move to approve Bluestone LLC service for tree removal. Fund name, next level trail, fund number 9107 in an amount not to exceed $19,653.21. Second. We have a motion and we have a second and we have Ms. Whitmer here from Parks. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is, uh, pertains to the Next Level Trails grant for the Cars Farm Greenway expansion to Ellisville. This is the south section. We need to remove trees in order to get the prefab bridge, the boardwalk and the connection to the over the railroad um, connected. So that's it in a nutshell. Right, thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Yeah, there are a lot of people who are really excited about this trail being finished and uh, I think it'll be highly appreciated. It's too bad that trees have to be removed for it, but um, sometimes that just is a sacrifice that's necessary. In the Northern section, uh, they're staging construction stuff next week. So there should be from Ellettsville uh, part of the trail done hopefully in the next 60 to 90 days. Excellent. Nice. Right. Yeah. yeah. Commissioner Giffins? Yeah, I, I, I would like for you to explain to the general public why the trees are being removed at this time of year. They have to be removed after October 1st because it's bat season, <laughs> April 1st to September 30th, and you do not remove trees because it's bat habitat and uh, reproduction time. So we wait till after October 1st to remove trees. Thank you. Uh, let's see if there's any public comment on this item. I don't see any. So with that, uh, Mr. Cocker, will you please call the roll on the motion to approve the Bluestone LLC service for tree removal? Mr. Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Githens. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item E, please. Move to approve USI consultants for Bayless Road Bridge number 45 replacement. Fund name, cumulative capital, fund number 1135 in the amount of $295,000 295, $295, and 350. Got that a little. <laughs> $295,350, yes, okay, yes. second. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> and I'm not sure I pronounced the name of the road correctly. How, how is that pronounced? We, 
we need another cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> so we have a motion and we have a second and we have Ms. Ridge. Good morning again. Um, so it is Bells Road um, bridge replacement. This is one of the bridges that's listed in our five year program. So we wanted to start uh, the design right away services, environmental permitting and surveys for the replacement of this bridge. Um, so design and everything can probably go out for probably till it can take about a year to get something under design. So Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? No, I don't. Commissioner Githens? Yeah. Uh, is, this a, is this a heavily traveled part of the county or a heavily traveled road? Um, no, it runs between Old 37 North and Kinzer Pike. Um, so there'll be ways, you know, once it goes under construction, there'll be ways for uh, different detour routes. Um, but I yeah. would not consider this a heavily traveled roadway, mm -hmm. um, but it's just one that has a lower sufficiency rating that we need to put it in the works of getting it replaced. Right. right. So no matter how often a, a bridge is traveled, it still needs to be safe. Um, and that was my follow-up question. So you already addressed it, which is how do you how do you find a way around yeah. a detour around this bridge yeah. construction? Um, so um, good. All right. Um, I, I did look it up where it is. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, let's see if there's any public comment on this item. Raise your, your hand in the Zoom screen, star nine. Seeing none, I'll uh, we'll come back uh, to the board. Uh, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on the motion to approve USI Consultants uh, contract for Bales Road Bridge number 45 replacement. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. All right. Thank you so much. Next item, please. Move to approve Regal Inc. Change order number one for Rogers Street Bridge number 908. Fund name, cumulative capital, fund number 1135 in the amount of a decrease of $1,968.66. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. And I wonder if somebody, maybe Ms. Purdy can look this up for me. I, it, just, it just struck me that I don't think these are cumcap. They're not. Kim Bridge. Kim Bridge. Oh, yeah. I'm the, sorry. I, I misread no, that. That's okay. No, no. It's, it's, um, it's incorrect on here, but the oh, fund number is right. But the fund number is correct. So we're okay. Um, it's, it's the correct fund number. So we're good. It is cumulative bridge. I was like, why are we seeing Kim Cap? Okay. Not, yeah, it's, it's wrong on our agenda. Okay. Anyway, uh, we. <laughs> We do have a motion and we do have a second and it is for cumulative bridge and Ms. Ridge, tell us all about it. So this was for the construction of Roger Street Bridge number 908. It was a community crossings project. Uh, it was completed the middle of September and opened. Um, the increase of $913.80 was for pavement markings and signs uh, for the signed pedestrian tour, tour, detour that was requested by the city. And then the de decrease of $2,906.96 is for the reduction in material due to a change in the curb and gutter detail that was requested by the contractor during construction. So that's how we came up with the a negative um, change order amount. Thank you so much. Comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? We don't see a whole lot of negative change orders. It's kind of enjoyable. It is. Commissioner Given. Yeah, I wondered if the um, signs for the pedestrian detour, were those just during the time that the bridge was being constructed or yes. is, are those permanent? They were just during the construction. It was kind of a pedestrian tour, a detour. Okay, thank you. All right, All right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, let's see if there are any um, uh, comments or questions from the public. Just raise your hand in the Zoom screen. I do not see any. And so with that, um, I'll come back to the board. Uh, uh, Mr. Cockrell, will you please call the roll on the change order number one for Rogers Street Bridge 908? 
Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. Great. And next item. Move to approve American Structure Point Inc. agreement for that road bridge number 79 replacement. Fund name cumulative bridge, fund number 1135 in the amount of $204,700. Second. Great. We have a motion and we have a second. Ms. Ridge, tell us all about it. Good morning. And this is actually uh, error on my behalf. It's actually Bridge 79 on War Road. Uh, we just did a, a, a contract for the, the bridge on that road a couple weeks ago. So um, I did send an email this morning to try and get that corrected. Um, so yeah, this is another one of our bridges that's in our five-year plan to be replaced. And we would like to begin the work on that. It will include the design and right-of-way engineering, survey, wetlands, delineation, uh, permitting, and utility coordination. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, comments, questions, Commissioner Jones? Um, does, is this going to require an amended um, motion to change the street name? I, no. I don't think so because it's got the bridge, the bridge numbers correct. Uh, Mr. Cockrell? I think that this, the minutes and the recording of this will reflect the corrected name. Okay, thank you. And no, I don't have any questions beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Commissioner Gibbons? Uh, no, but it just brings up again the fact that bridges are expensive. Um, but we've also had really uh, good a good working relation with American Structure Point. And mm -hmm. So I hope that continues. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And let's see if there are any um, members of the public who wish to comment on this item. Raise your hand on the Zoom screen, star nine. I do not see any. Uh, so with that, Mr. Cocker, will you please call the roll on the American Structure Point Agreement for Roar Road Bridge Number 79 replacement? 75. 75? Okay. Yeah, it's Bridge 75 oh, on Roar Road. Yeah. Ah. Then we ah. do need... Uh. No, we're good. We're good. Okay. Bridge 75, Roar Road uh, replacement. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Giffins. Yes. Motion is approved three to zero. All right, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we have one more agenda item, uh, but it is a long one. And so I think it would um, be useful to take a quick break if my colleagues are amenable. Um, let's uh, take a 10 minute um, recess and come back at 11.15. All right, great, thank you. All right, I'm going to um, bring this meeting back uh, to order, back into session, and um, we will move on to agenda item H, please. Move to approve ordinance 2021-36, trails at Robertson Farm Reso. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Um, and we have uh, Ms. Payne from planning um, to provide us with uh, an explanation of this petition. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Let's share my screen here, please. Okay, can everybody see this slide okay? Yeah, okay, great. Okay. Um, I will, uh, so I will introduce this petition and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Larry Wilson just to say a few things on, um, on this petition um, in order for us to go forward. So this is the trails at Robertson Farm rezone request. Um, the request is for a rezone from RE1 to MR. Um, it is for one uh, parcel that contains 44 acres um, in section 20 of Perry Township. 
and it is located at 4691 yeah, South Victor Pike. Um, excuse, me, again, excuse me, just a minute, Rebecca. Could whoever is yeah. not muted mute because we're getting a lot of other noise in the background here. I think it may be at the planning office. Okay, thank you. Sure, okay. Um, so the site is currently zoned uh, estate residential one. Uh, and in the comprehensive plan, it is designated as Makua Mixed Residential. Um, so with that, with those basics, um, I am going to let Larry Wilson speak here for just a moment. Good morning. I, I, I'm going to go over uh, some of the, uh, Rebecca, if you can mute, because there's feedback coming through. Okay. Uh, I want to go through some of the uh, uh, items in regard to this. First of all, this is being forwarded to the commissioners with a, a uh, without a recommendation from the plan commission. Uh, the plan commission, which is formally known as an advisory plan commission, makes recommendations to the commissioners in regard to uh, changes in the, both the zoning ordinance text and any change in the zoning ordinance map. This is an amendment. Uh, this is a proposal to amend the zoning map from Rowe County uh, to change the zoning, zoning for this particular parcel. Uh, again, uh, the significance of a no recommendation is that um, if it's a positive recommendation and the commissioners do not act upon the uh, proposed ordinance within 90 days, it goes into effect with no recommendation. Uh, 90 days, it fails. So that's the real significance here. Uh, I will note that the uh, plan commission could not agree on a majority uh, in regard to either a positive or a uh, negative recommendation in regard to the Sony map amended. Uh, so they elected to forward it to you with no recommendation. One other thing I do want to uh, discuss is um, there have been some advertisements and, and uh, uh, flyers that basically indicate that county departments have endorsed this project. Uh, I want to clarify and emphasize that the planning department does not endorse projects. And I think that's probably equally true of the highway department and other county departments. We review a proposed zoning map amendment for consistency with the comprehensive plan and make a recommendation based on that. Uh, Secondly, we, we review it to make sure that if the zoning map is approved, the change is approved, that the uh, site would be able to provide the necessary infrastructure and services to serve the density proposed under the zoning map amendment. Uh, the final thing I wanna address is, as you can see, these, the amount of material we received on this project is huge. Um, we have attempted to compile that and to present it to you um, as comprehensively as, as possible. However, this is a legislative decision. This is not a Board of Zoning Appeals case where we are preparing a packet uh, that could theoretically be reviewed by a court. Um, again, if you pass the zoning ordinance and follow all the necessary procedures, I don't believe that's a challenge uh, can be challenged in a court. Um, other than that, the, the final thing I say, we have not reviewed or approved any particular site plan or subdivision for this site uh, in any detail. Uh, there has been a, a schematic showing a possible site uh, development pattern. Uh, again, any if this is if the zoning map is changed, any development this site will have to be reviewed uh, through the subdivision ordinance to make sure it meets all property development standards and all necessary infrastructure have been installed. Um, I will turn this back over to Rebecca to handle the case for her, but I did want to emphasize um, those factors before we get started. Thank you, Larry. Um, okay, so so once again, this is a request for a rezone from a state residential to medium density residential. And as the petitioner state, the purpose for the request, request is to further develop 
the lot to create attainable middle-class housing in Monroe County. So uh, the petitioners are proposing a mix of housing types, including single family homes, impaired patio homes. They anticipate roughly 125 lots, um, which is suitable in the medium, medium density residential zoning designation which allows for a density of 4.8 lots per acre. Oh, yes. And the proposal does include at this time two ingress egress points, um, both at South Victor Pike. But in addition to these ingress egress points, they are also proposing a connection to the Clear Creek Trail and a connection to the Bloomington Rail Trail. Both trails run adjacent at points um, to this petition site. Uh, here we have a site condition map. Um, if you consider the roadway acreage and a utility easement that runs through the petition site, um, you are left with about 27 acres of uh, buildable land. So this petition has um, been through several committees and been reviewed across um, all of our commissioner boards, um, drainage boards. Um, I'd like to note that it came to us originally um, about 10 months ago now as a PUD request. Um, but after hearing some feedback and input from the planning department and other departments, county departments, um, petitioners withdrew that PUD request and instead submitted um, for a rezone request to uh, high density residential. Um, and after one, after more feedback, um, once again decided that in the end they would like to ultimately request for the medium dis medium density zoning designation. Um, so consequently, this petition, um, while it had a few different um, um, objectives in the beginning, um, it is now you know, um, going for the medium density zoning dis designation and has been through um, several discussions and meetings. Um, so I'd like to also point out that um, at the plan commission meeting on August 17th, uh, Larry mentioned this, but uh, there was a, a motion to um, move forward with a, a vote of no recommendation. So um, looking at some of the review of this petition in particular, um, our stormwater folks uh, have had a chance to look at this in detail. Um, and in fact, in March of 2021, the drainage board did approve the preliminary drainage plan that the petitioners have provided. Um, and they do feel that it will comply with the uh, standards and the new critical drainage release rates. Um, in other review, the highway department also uh, is, uh, feels the petition at this point um, is meeting the standards and uh, they feel they can support the improvements specifically that are being proposed on Victor Pike. Regarding will serve and capacity letters, uh, petitioners did obtain and supply to us um, letters for, for natural gas, sewer, water, and electric. Um, and there was a discussion over the fire hydrants. Um, while the Monroe Fire Protection District states that they can cover and serve this property, um, they won't be providing fire hydrants, but the engineer and the petitioners have confirmed to us that there will be full capacity for fire hydrants um, with a private entity providing the lines and maintenance. Um, so in terms of a staff recommendation, we planning department gives a positive recommendation based on the findings of fact subject to the county highway and drainage engineer reports and specifically 
staff recommends or feels that the medium density residential zoning is an appropriate zoning designation for this site um, for at least two reasons. Uh, we believe that the medium density zoning is a, is a transition zone um, that fits well with the northern higher density neighborhoods um, nearby, as well as, as the southern lower density zoning districts. Um, and we also um, appreciate and like the proximity to trails and consider that an asset to this zoning designation. Um, and further, the comprehensive plan does support medium density residential here. Um, there are other parcels nearby that are, are zoned similarly under the comp plan and are currently zoned medium density residential. Um, and just finally, the comp plan in the phase one Makua, they've designated this area as mixed residential. And then um, phase two Makua designated it as neighborhood de development. Um, so once again, uh, supporting the medium density residential rezone request um, in that, in terms of alignment. Um, so I just wanna spend a quick minute here looking at the design standards. Uh, again, once again, um, the property is currently zoned estate residential one on the far right side of this column. <clears throat> you can see the different requirements under the existing zoning um, and, you, and uh, to compare, um, follow the column down for the medium density residential zone. Um, so there is obviously um, under the medium density residential designation, more opportunity for um, density. Um, but this is a good uh, illustration of the differences here between the existing zone and what's being proposed. Um, and like I said, once again, what is being proposed is single family dwellings, including single family attached, single family and single family detached. And this, of course, these two would be permitted in the MR zone, along with the other um, uses that you see in the MR column here on the table, um, in the use table. Um, this is a, a visual of the existing zoning. Um, here is the petition site that we are talking about. Um, as, and as you can see, it's, um, there is some existing MR in the vicinity, and then the darker red shades here are, PUD, are PUDs. Um, and then as we move farther south and out, um, we get into a little more um, less dense zoning districts. Um, so with that, I will take any questions. Comments, questions, uh, Commissioner Jones? Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Sorry. Um, I do have a question about the width of the roads. I believe it's Victor Pike. And um, there have been questions concerning whether the road is actually that wide at all or at all places. Um, yeah, so Victor Pike is considered a major collector and um, it's a total of, I think, 80 feet wide here at the petition site. Um, so there is plenty of right of way, both on the west side and east side to accommodate the, um, the, the, the volume that would generate um, that would be generated from this uh, development. Um, so yes, the highway has looked at that right of way and does feel that what's being proposed, the improvements that are being proposed are um, meeting our standards. Yeah, what I asked is if the entire road is at least 30 feet wide because traffic doesn't stop right at the entrance to the subdivision traffic goes up and down the whole road that, that may be a good question for Ms. Ridge if it looks yes. like she may still be on I'm sorry I that probably is much better no, for okay. her. no it's, it's a good question Ms. Ridge I would I'm going to say that I would guess that the average of that roadway is 18 feet wide um, from for Victor Pike 
there could be some areas where if you might have some tree overgrowth that might make it visually seem like it's maybe a little bit more narrow. But um, overall, um, I would say that road does average at 18 feet wide for the whole length. Okay, and but you did say that it was 30 feet wide, didn't you, Ms. Payne? No, I'm saying they're proposing, a, well, it's 35 feet on the west side and 45 feet on the east side for a total of 80. She's talking about right away. I'm talking yeah. about right away. Okay, yeah, I understand. Um, okay, thank you. Did you have any other questions, Commissioner Jones, for planning? Not immediately. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Giffens. Um, well, I'm not sure who all gets some of these questions, so I may jump in and out okay. with things. With the, uh, with the utilities, um, there was no mention in there of any broadband. And I would think that people that are in a proposed middle class um, housing development would, would want access to that. Um, yeah, I haven't. The, the topic of broadband hasn't really been discussed to this point. Um, perhaps if um, the petitioners are speaking later in this presentation, um, they can address that. Okay, um, do you know if the developers have gotten approval from the city of Bloomington for the proposed connections to the two trails? Um, I know they've been in discussions, yeah. But I, I, they I guess I approval. don't know the actual status of the, um, you know, what the city is. Okay. What they say um, about it. And I guess it was a much earlier version of things that the planning commission reviewed. Um, the developers claim that there's going to be frontage or that there is frontage for this property along that road. Um, I couldn't find any frontage for this property along that road. Is that incorrect? That what they claim? That's not frontage if they can't use it. At least to me, it's not frontage. Um, Well, I, I guess I'm in, if they're talking about something else that I'm not aware of, then perhaps that's something else they can address when they speak. Okay. Um, and I don't know whether, I think this should probably go to um, Ms. Ms. Uh, Ridge, but um, I was in touch with people at Lighthouse Christian Academy. Um, they have 270 students uh, currently. Some of them, of course, drive themselves to and from school, but um, they, Lighthouse Christian Academy closes off their uh, entrance and exit from uh, that road during, for drop off and pickup of students. And in fact, during the whole school day, the only way to get into their property is um, off of Victor Pike. And so I wondered if the, daily, if the average daily traffic count included those 270 students being dropped off and picked up five days a week um, in terms of, of how things were, were calculated and done. Yes, they would have taken into a factor that the school did have um, that traffic. And when we do traffic counts, it's, we usually do them for a 48 hour period. Um, and we try and do it during the week and midweek. So we're uh, tackling all of those conditions. Okay, thank you. Um, again, I'm not sure who, <laughs> who to ask some of these things to. Um, so um, apparently they're gonna tear down the existing home and other uh, things on the property from what I read, is that correct? But they stayed there, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Maybe I'll just wait and hold these for the for others um, as they come on. Um, okay. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's go ahead and hear from the petitioner, petitioner's representative. 
Can please give us your name. Good morning. morning. <laughs> this is this is Donnie Atkins and Kevin Schmidt. Good morning. Can, can you guys see us and hear us all right? We sure can. All right. Rebecca, will you do us the favors you always do of uh, throwing up our presentation so everyone can see it, please? Thank you. Sir. All right, I'll lead off. Uh, Rebecca, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. I'll let you guys know real quick that it's Jackie who's running the slideshow at this oh. point. <laughs> Jackie's great at it too. Thank you so much, Jackie and Rebecca. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, it's taken us a long time to get here, and we're very eager to share this package with you. Uh, we certainly know Commissioner Thomas has seen a lot of this before, so we apologize for reviewing it uh, again with her. But uh, for Commissioners uh, Givens and Jones, we definitely want to make sure we uh, we give you the the full overview. Uh, and then, of course, we're certainly eager and willing to answer any questions you have um, at any point in this package. So please don't hesitate. So just a quick introduction of uh, of who Kevin and I are. Uh, I am a graduate from uh, IU, a uh, proud graduate, uh, and, uh, and after I uh, graduated, I uh, was commissioned as an officer in the Air Force and served all over the world. Since I uh, did six years in the Air Force and after that, I um, have been working major energy projects around the world in all sorts of different places, and uh, very much looking forward to getting back to the roots in, uh, in Bloomington and Monroe County. Kevin, uh, unfortunately, didn't graduate from IU, but he certainly has a connection and, uh, and a lot of affection for it as well, as uh, his wife's parents uh, were our graduates of IU and, uh, and, uh, and were married there. Go ahead, if you could, Jackie. So just want to talk just a little bit about our inspiration, and we want to get in the details, of course, but you know, we, we want to make sure everyone understands where we're coming from. And, and I have four kids, and Kevin has two. And, uh, and, and what's guided us from the beginning is, a, is, a, is this vision and desire to create a neighborhood that our families would love and other families in Moreau County would as well. That would set you know, another benchmark and be one of those names that's appreciated throughout the county like Winslow Farms and others. And, um, and, and you can see there, there's, there's my kids there and their IU gear and, and, and Bloomington and Moreau County is, is always so great to our family. And, um, and, and we, you know, we, we want to make sure this neighborhood becomes another keystone of the county. Um, you know, so, so I touched on our vision there with the kids, but also want to, to just, you know, add on that this, this, this parcel is such a beautiful and amazing place. And not only could it be the, the place for a whole bunch of future families, but also was the uh, where 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 the Robertson girls were raised, and we want to continue that legacy for many more middle class Monroe County families that you know are so desperate right now for some decent houses that are actually attainable with um, the wages that they're making, and that builds and adds to what the um, what what the county needs. And the other point we touch on there, and we'll touch several times in this package, is that. We've done this from day one with an incredible amount of respect and desire to make sure we stay connected with the environment. And you know, if, if we wanna get into details, we certainly can with the multitude of environmental surveys and everything we've done throughout the design to ensure that we've captured all the data we need and incorporated that in the design to ensure that we stay connected and protect the environment around us. And Kevin will touch on that more, how you know, what we've done in the karst areas and and as uh, Rebecca showed and displayed earlier, all the areas we've resegregated off to protect the wetlands and, uh, and, and the other areas around the neighborhood. Next slide, please. I'll turn it over to Kevin now. Good morning, commissioners. So this, um, we're gonna spend a little bit of time just going over kind of what, what our goal is with this community. Um, and give a little bit of an idea of what you're going to be getting um, when, when you look at uh, approving this, this development. So the, the goal is to build a really diverse, strong community with high quality attainable housing for the Monroe County families. Uh, we, we believe in, in a high quality product, um, in something that is responsible growth and really focuses on limiting urbanization and urbanizing urban sprawl. So we, we believe that this really creates significant green space um, and is really connected with both the environment and the community. The, uh, the surrounding rail trails and Clear Creek Trail are a huge asset to the, both the city and the county. Um, the residents of this area use it all the time. And we believe that this neighborhood will really 
reinforce the value of that infrastructure um, with creating a, a park, community gardens, dog parks, um, looking at areas to increase the number of trees on the land overall, since currently it is a, is a pasture land, um, and really preserve and educate people on the unique features of the environmental area, um, including you know, things like the, uh, the bat habitats. Um, when we did our environmental studies, that was one of the things that was noted that our, the wetlands in the northeast corner were great bat habitats. And again, that's something we plan on preserving and, and even plan on talking with uh, with the drainage board about looking at ways of educating people on what is a karst feature, what is, what is, why is it, why are these bat habitats, what are their seasons. Um, so those are some of the things that we've been working on um, on the side as well. Uh, and this really does improve, I mean there's been a lot of discussion around drainage, um, but you know obviously this area has had some significant flooding issues um, back in June, um, earlier in 2019. And this is, this is partially because of um, earlier developments and partially because of the fact that this land is not in compliance with the current critical watershed requirements. So we are proposing and planning on meeting all of those most stringent requirements that the county has um, as, as part of this development. So not only we're we protecting the future residents of the trails, but also the current neighbors and future neighbors of the, uh, of the trails. You can go to the next slide, please, Jackie. So this, this uh, just quick um, talk about MR rezone versus RE1. Um, I think the key is, and, and you know, Larry said it right, that this is not an approved layout. However, this is, we've been fairly consistent with this layout for the last 10 months. Gotten a lot of feedback from Larry, Jackie, Rebecca, as well as the planning commission and the neighbors. Um, that this is, this is probably one of the best um, layouts possible for the, uh, for the land, given taking into account the trails, et cetera. Um, so you can see on the right, the idea of the lots, the sizes, um, some of the green spaces as well. You can see uh, where the drainage will be again in the Northeast corner, the South, and then in, up in the, uh, in the Northwest. Uh, the other thing I think that's important on this map is you can see some of the phasing. So if you see those green dotted lines, um, there's the green dotted lines, the blue dotted lines, and then the purple dotted lines, those are the three different phases. And we propose to build this out in three phases again, focusing on making sure that we're taking care of the, both the environment and the neighbors while doing this um, is a very important to us. So just a few key pieces. Um, this is really aligned with, with the planning staff. Um, we have spent a great deal of time with Rebecca and Jackie. I'm sure they're probably tired of seeing emails from us, but uh, you know, they've been very supportive um, of getting us to where we are. Um, we've taken a lot of feedback from both the neighbors, planning staff, planning commission, um, yourselves and just trying to understand what is what is the right thing for this area. So we've we've uh, spent a lot of time getting there. Um, really focused on aligning with what is what is surrounding um, the example surrounding density, uh, the surrounding neighborhoods, and looking at what uh, infrastructure the county has put in place and how we can leverage that um, related to the comprehensive plan, urbanizing area, uh, thoroughfare plan, etc. Um, and then, you know, the, the pieces that I think Rebecca mentioned already was the MS4 coordinator drainage board and the highway um, really focused on making sure that this is, this is aligned and even going above and beyond what they believe is necessary for this development. Next slide. So, so why the trails and why this location? Um, I think, uh, you know, maybe a better question is of, of the few remaining parcels in Monroe County, um, we, we really think that this is one of the best areas to do this. This meets all of the needs for a growing community, um, for a growing number of people in the county. Um, South Victor Pike is 100% of the utility infrastructure required. There's no investment required from the county. And I think this is a really important piece. I mean, there was a lot of conversation earlier on this call about investment you guys are making in the trails um, and other infrastructure around the county. And uh, really, this, this area has already been built out for this. Um, you know, the predecessors have, have focused on making sure this is available and we just want to make sure to take, to leverage that, that capital that has been spent and use it in a, in a very responsible way. Um, the comprehensive plan and urbanizing plan really do designate this land as MR to HR density. And, uh, you know, through conversations with planning staff, we've aligned that, that MR and really the, the actual density we're providing is really closer akin to LR 
but um, you know, this is the MR density is the right designation for this area. Um, the density is consistent with the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, we've got a slide that we'll mention with you later, but the, the, really the focus here is looking at making sure we're not doing something that doesn't fit the area. Um, and the surrounding roads are des designated as major collectors and they do have easy access to highways and then into town. Um, it brings Robertson Farm into compliance with the critical watershed, which we talked a little bit about, and that is a very significant reduction. We're not talking about 10, 20 percent, talking about 80 percent reduction, which is orders of magnitude of reduction over the current water that is flowing into rate that is flowing into the into the rivers. Um, provides access and improvements on the on the county trail networks, and uh, I know that was a question. Um, Professor or uh, Commissioner Gifton said uh, we, we do have approval um, and have been working with uh, with the, the, the appropriate people to, to make those connections to the trails. Um, obviously, that will continue on as we develop the exact details of the locations, but that is something we've been working with them on um, and allows attainable housing, which uh, is really, really critical. If you can, on the next slide, Jackie, please. So here's just a, a bit of an idea of some of the types of housing we're looking at. Again, we, we've partnered with a longstanding local builder that offers very high quality products, been, in, been working in Monroe County for decades. Um, we, we really believe that the trails will be a visual benchmark of housing and um, that you know, we, we're gonna have multiple elevations, multiple designs and multiple color palettes that will really allow this neighborhood to set itself apart and not be a cookie cutter uh, situation. Next slide. So this is um, just an overview, kind of a, a bird's eye view of the idea behind the terrace park. Um, if you can understand, this would be on the northeast side of the site. Um, on the, the, the bottom of this picture would be the trail, uh, the Bloomington Rail Trail. And uh, that we would have a connection onto here with things like BMX bike parks, adventure parks, um, both larger children's adventure parks, trails, um, and you can see the, the darker green is where all the trees and, uh, and existing infrastructure is. We, we plan on leveraging that with things like uh, tree houses and, and a very natural park. Um, up near, closer into the neighborhood, there would be more of a, a lawn area for picnicking, um, a gazebo, uh, a smaller children's park for the, the both the trail users as well as the uh, the people in the neighborhood to take their children and play. Um, so we're always very excited about this. Um, been in talks with with other people in the county about about the opportunities associated with this, and really would love additional feedback on any other opportunities to put here. But we really believe that this is a a very exciting area for uh, for this this type of thing to go in. And so here's a here's a view from the trail. If you were looking up, you might see some you know raised boardwalks over the wetlands, um, again, preserving the natural environment, focused on trees, um, you know, natural swing sets, et cetera, just trying to really leverage the existing area. And again, focus on the education, you know, put some educational signs in there, have people be able to learn a little bit about what the wetlands are in Monroe County. So again, just a few more pictures of uh, some of the ideas around, you know, building a park that is uh, that is included in the environment. Some of the other things we're looking at are dog parks. Um, so we've got a location for a dog park picked out and then a community garden. Again, something that we've seen um, in, in Monroe County and uh, something that we think is really, really exciting and the residents will really like. Um, just trying to stay in tune with uh, both what uh, the environment is looking for and you know future residents are looking for as far as the, uh, the sustainability of a neighborhood. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it back over to uh, my colleague, Donnie. Thanks for that, Kevin. Just wanna spend just a few minutes at which, you know, I, I think everybody is aware of how tight the housing market is in the US and of course, Monroe County as well, and maybe more so in Monroe County. And, and this is just a data set from a few months ago, but if you took any month snapshot, you would see something very similar for the last 12 to 14 months, if not longer which is really indicates how stressed attainable housing is. And so this is all of Monroe County. And if you look at homes in the 300,000, 400,000, 200,000, $150,000 price range, 
you can see those that red column over there, and that's how many months of supply there is. And you know, a healthy market is defined as six months. And basically, you see there up until you get to about six hundred thousand. We truncated the the five hundred until you get to six hundred thousand. There is a drastic shortage of supply that, of course, is corroborated by anybody that's tried to find a decent house right now that isn't you know a tear down that is you know in the 250 to 300 to 400 thousand dollar price range that you can be proud to raise your family in. And so that is the market that we're targeting. You know, it was brought up um, two weeks ago that, you know, could, can the developer guarantee what our price ranges may or may not be? And, and, uh, and fair enough, no, if, if this is approved, it, it can't be guaranteed, but we guarantee it that this is the market we are shooting for. This is the problem that exists, and this is the problem that we want to solve for Monroe County. It does us no good to build homes that are six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollar McMansions because it solves no problem, and hence why we have this strong desire and this, you know, uh, this this request to rezone to a higher density. Next slide, please. You know, just want to touch on that. I'm sure it's pretty obvious to everyone that the more homes you put on a given site, the cheaper the homes can be based on the land. But, you know, it, contrasting between RE1, which would be roughly 30 to 40 homes, and our current request, MR, which is roughly around 125, we can drop the, the fixed cost, if you will, or the direct cost per the lot by, by 50%. And that is what will allow us and yield us to, to deliver homes that people can afford and that are attainable for them. And, and again, uh, it's probably pretty obvious, but you know, it's, it's a drastic difference. And, and, and this is what's required in order for us to deliver homes that people can, can, can attain with a middle-class living. Next slide, please. I'll switch it back to Kevin All right. on density. So we're going to spend a little bit of time, appreciate your guys' attention, and we're just spend a little bit of time going through some of the things that we heard over the last two weeks um, of things that were concerns that were brought up, raised by both the commissioners and, and the, uh, the public. So um, one, of the, one of the things mentioned last week was, or two weeks ago, was the density. Um, you know, I think that it's, uh, we wanted to kind of try and make sure that everyone understood when we say this density is too dense for the area or that it's not consistent with the area, we want to kind of try and put that in context with numbers. Um, that's you notice, Donnie and I like to talk about you know facts and numbers. Um, so one of the keys here is looking at the trails is proposing a density that is 2.8 lots per acre. Now, if you co compare that to the surrounding neighborhoods um, that have the same infrastructure, now that's a key important piece is that neighborhoods of more than five houses can't be built in Monroe County without sewage. Um, and, and existing infrastructure. So if you compare that to areas that have that infrastructure, um, we are actually lower density than the surrounding neighborhoods. The actual average surrounding neighborhoods is 3.7 lots per acre. And that's, that's neighborhoods within less than a mile of our land. Um, the density of the trails is lower than the comprehensive plan and future CDO propose. Uh, we notable new neighborhoods like Highland Park Estates is an average density of 4.3 lots per acre. Um, and the trails is consistent with or less dense than all of these. So again, if you look at LR zoning, LR zoning allows for a maximum of 3.0 lots per acre and we are actually less than that at 2.8 lots per acre. And this again assumes 125 homes, um, which is what our um, our layout showed was achievable, main, maintaining, um, ensuring that we account for the environmental features, um, some of the other utility features, um, drainage, et cetera. So really making sure that we've taken all those into account, this is what we believe is achievable um, at this site. And again, akin to maybe more of an LR zoning density, if you wanna talk pure density. Um, the trails request for MR is, is truly what we believe consistent with and, and well balanced for this transitioning area. Uh, the next topic that I think has been discussed a lot is, is traffic. Um, and I know it was brought up a, a number of times. Um, Victor Pike is designed as a major collector, designated as a major collector per the Monroe County Thoroughfare Plan. And that plan was developed in 2018. So it's only three years old. 
I think it's really important to make sure that, um, that, it's, that it's understood that for context, there's other major collectors in the county include SR45, SR446, uh, Fairfax, et cetera. There's some other major roads that I think will be very easy for people to relate to, to understand what, what, a, what a major collector is designated as. Um, the trails upgrade plan for South Victor Pike is fully aligned with a thoroughfare plan and has been reviewed and accepted by the county highway engineers. So we've spent a lot of time with Paul and Lisa um, working this. Uh, you know, Paul has, has gone as far as to say in the, uh, in the last planning commission meeting that we're going above and beyond um, what is necessary uh, for this neighborhood and believes that we will very easily be able to manage the increase in traffic uh, on, this, on this road. Uh, the thoroughfare plan confirms South Victor Pike can and is intended to be improved for county as the county develops. And I think that's a key piece. If you see in the bottom left-hand corner, that yellow red circle, that is South Victor Pike. And South Victor Pike is specifically designated in this area as a major collector and will be something that has the ability to be improved as necessary. Um, but even without those improvements, if you can go to the next slide, please, Jackie. Um, we, we did some research based on the conversation last in the last two weeks. And uh, in this being designated as a major collector, we looked at the, um, the average daily trips, right? And so if you look at average daily trips and you look at INDOT, and they have a database for this, Lisa mentioned a little bit how it's done. Um, they have a database for this. Victor Pike is, has a uh, 1,132 average daily trips, right? And if you use the Institute of Transportation Engineers ADT calculator for single family homes, the trails will add about 877 average daily trips. And that assumes 135 homes, which is 10 more than we believe we would even be able to get on there. So again, very being very conservative. And that, uh, that assumes about, just for reference, uh, people who've heard about six and a half trips per home per day. Um, so adding these together and assuming a local growth factor of 15%. So again, we're talking about 135 homes in an area we think is only 125 and assuming a 15% growth factor for the entire area, you add up to a final average daily trips that's 2,310. So if you look at that value, 2,310, it results, and this is specifically from the Monroe County Thoroughfare Plan, page 16. If you look at this, it says that we are achieving an A level of service. Now, I think it's really important to understand that an A level of service is the best possible level of service that you can provide in a two lane road segment. Um, if you look, it actually says that level of service D or better is typically considered to be acceptable and what they consider to be uncongested. Um, so you can see that we are on the top end, even in a conservative case, on the top end of what is considered to be acceptable. I think this is really important. And again, we spent a lot of time with Lisa and Paul going through this, um, helping make sure that we were not missing anything and understood everything because um, we were, uh, you know, very excited about the um, this development and think that it can really add a lot of value. And one of the things we were worried about was making sure that we weren't creating traffic problems, both for the neighborhood and for the community. And uh, this has reinforced our previous belief and previous conversations with Paul that we do not believe that will be an issue. Next slide, please. Um, so this is another thing, again, listening to the neighbors, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, uh, remonstration against this uh, against this development, and to be honest, most of it's been focused around the uh, issues around flooding, and we 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 understand that uh, we are very sensitive to it, um, but we want to make sure that everyone understands that what's going on there right now has nothing to do with the trails development. In fact, it is what it is now, and if we don't do anything about it, it's what will continue to happen. So these pictures you see here are pictures that happened in June, and this is without any development. So if we do nothing, this is what's gonna to continue to happen. If you go to the next slide, please, Jackie. I think we mentioned that, that uh, this is really something we've spent a lot of time focusing on. And if you see all these yellow areas, this is all the areas that we plan on adding in very robust drainage plans. Um, the, the detention basins and what we're trying to do here is very, very important to managing the runoff in this area. Um, we will be actually reducing the runoff because we're becoming compliant with the critical watershed, reducing the runoff by more than 80%. So if, if I can put that in, in standard cubic feet um, of flow per second, 
that's going from 103 cubic feet per second to 17. So you can see that's an order of magnitude drop in the amount of water that's decreased, that's coming off of this site when we're done and throughout our construction process. So I think this is something that, again, will be really, really beneficial for the area, really beneficial for the community, and something that we have spent a lot of time with um, some very, very intelligent people in, uh, in the drainage and in the county to help make sure that we get this done right. Um, you know, our, our engineering team at Bynum and Fanyo have spent a lot of time on this, and we've done no, numerous iterations to ensure that we are not missing anything. Um, in fact, you know, one of the things that one of our, our lead engineers there has done is some previous calculations he did at other developments during the June rainstorm went and checked to make sure that none of those had overflown or we missed any of the calculations. And, uh, and those all came back very, very consistent with what our expectations were. So again, just reinforcing our belief that the calculations, and if you look at the engineering and the science, this is really gonna help the area. Uh, then uh, we also heard uh, two weeks ago some, some talk about karst. Um, and, and again, that's something that we were very well educated on and uh, have learned a lot about over the last 10 months. And I think that, you know, this, if you look at the left, this is a plan, uh, a site of Indiana and shows all the dark orange is karst areas in Indiana. So about 50% of the, of the county is, is karst, has karst features. Um, all the yellow areas are the 2011 sinkhole inventory and karst springs. So again, you can see that blue area that I've highlighted here is where there are thousands and thousands of homes in neighborhoods in the county and in the city. Um, it is areas where there are hundreds and hundreds of, of individuals, roads, et cetera, that have seen no issues um, because they've been responsibly managed. And then if again, you see the little green area here, this is the trail site. And there are no karst or sinkhole area ind indicated there from the 2011 sinkhole inventory. Um, when we did our surveys, we found there to be a single sinkhole in the southeast portion of the site, and then five features in the northeast portion um, that will require a setback. Um, and they are they are being accounted as karst features, um, despite their their very small size. And so we have developed the entire um, development around them to protect that, to protect the environment and to protect the karst features. Um, we've also had Jason Crothy, who is the expert in the area who did the survey, um, come on during the planning commission discussions and educate people uh, a little bit on what is to be expected during construction. So um, per the Monroe County zoning ordinance, there are ways to handle if karst features are identified during construction. We are very happy to and plan on following those. He have, however, indicated that he believes the possibility of that is very, very small. Um, and that the, once the development is built, um, that there is little to no risk for any one or any housing development um, or individual that will be related to karst features. So again, just following the math and the science and the experts, we believe that not only have we de developed around this, um, we're protecting it and making sure that we don't have any liabilities for future residents. The, um, so the next, next few slides are just a little bit of um, a feedback from some of the, the newspapers and a little bit of research that we've done over the last months um, about what people are saying. Um, I think it's really important to understand and be connected to what, what individuals are saying. So if you look at um, some quotes from individuals, for, for first quote is uh, Margaret Clements um, said at the county commissioners, told the county commissioners that we need to take a look and build more single family housing. housing. We need to meet the true needs of our constituents. Um, the trails is 100% single family homes. We believe that this is a diverse offering and that we are gonna be offering a wide range of people, home ownership in the county that currently are struggling to find that. Um, the, the bottom two are business leaders um, that, that really are focused on making sure that we are not making the wrong decisions um, to promote development, uh, to, to bring in business, to bring in people, and to, to ensure that we maintain the really high quality of diverse housing that the Monroe County really, really does need. If you can go to the next slide, please, Jackie. 
And then this is, um, you know, talking a little bit about the comprehensive plan. I think, uh, you know, we haven't touched on this too much, but the comprehensive plan is something that's really been a guiding focus for us. Um, we believe the comprehensive plan was developed with significant intent. Obviously, there was significant cost associated with it. Um, there was a significant number of people involved then that are still involved now. And um, it really, truly was the voice of the community. Um, you know, I spent a little bit of time reading back through the meeting minutes of all of the meetings around the time that the, the conference of plan was approved, both the commission meeting minutes as well as the planning commission minutes. And uh, I was very surprised um, to see how much support there was um, from the community for this plan. Um, just given what I had heard in the last six or seven months about the conference plan, I thought maybe there was a little bit more um, disdain for it, but uh, it was surprised that, you know, e almost every single one of the commissioners and a number of the planning commission um, who, you know, you can see here below said very, very good things about not only how it was built, um, taking into account both of the communities, the community's comments, um, their concerns and listening to what they did as well as understanding how we were preventing future issues. Um, like urban sprawl, et cetera. This, this really was eye-opening to me um, that the number of people that signed off on this and approved it were, were really 100% bought into it. And we truly believe, and I think the planning staff believes as well and has continued to reiterate it, that we are 100% aligned with the comprehensive plan. The next slide. So this was, uh, this was one of the things that I thought was really um, really eye-opening for me. And so this was uh, Mark Stoops. He was a commissioner at the time. And I'll just, I'll just read what he said. It was, uh, and I know this plan is closer to the community has been asking for in Monroe, in Monroe County for decades. And that, that, and that it is a plan that preserves the rural character and limits the effects of urban sprawl on a rural area in our environmentally sensitive areas and really focuses on new developments closer to our urban centers which already have infrastructure and that the public is paid for and put in place to handle that growth. So again, if I read what was, what was envisioned almost 10 years ago, um, we do believe that we are trying to enact what was envisioned 10 years ago. And, uh, and I think, you know, if, if Mark was here and, and talking with us, I think hopefully he would, uh, he would be saying the same thing now. So. So here's just some some quick points. Um, you know, I mentioned that that we believe we are 100% aligned with the conference of plan. I want to back that up with facts, not just uh, conjecture. Um, the mixed residential neighborhoods. These are quotes from the conference of plan. Mixed residential neighborhoods accommodate a wide array of both single-family homes and attached housing types integrated in a cohesive neighborhood. We think that that is definitely something we are doing. Uh, these neighborhoods are intended to serve growing market demand. Um, for new housing choices and a full spectrum of demographic groups. Again, something we think we're very focused on. Transportation, uh, mixed residential neighborhoods is intended to be designed as a walkable neighborhood. Neighborhoods designed should be should de-emphasize the automobile. I don't know that you can think of a single spot in Monroe County where that's more possible than, than at the trails development. Um, utilities, mixed residential areas designated for land use plan um, located within existing sewer service areas. So I already mentioned earlier that you can't have developments of more than five houses without sewer. Um, again, that is, that is a key focus for this area. Um, open space, pocket parks, green squares, commons, neighborhood parks, greenways, and appropriate for mixed residential neighborhoods. We meet and exceed in every single one of those categories. Um, and developmental guidelines. We plan on meeting um, all of the MR zoning requirements. Again, Larry mentioned at the beginning that this approval um, for MR rezone does not necessarily give us the right to do anything that we have planned in our layout, that will all happen at a separate time. But we are committed to and focused on making sure that we meet all of the MR zoning requirements. Uh, so in summary, um, I think, you know, we really appreciate your guys, your ladies' time. Um, we have, we believe that there's 120 to 130 single family homes. Um, owners will invest in their homes and the county. Uh, again, home ownership, I think it was mentioned on here before that home ownership is a really key driver to uh, the community, um, buy into the community, participation in the community, et cetera. Um, the trails is focused on high quality attainable homes. 
We believe that this neighborhood will feature amenities that are going to set a benchmark for families and the county to enjoy. Um, the development plan is guided and follows a comprehensive plan and urbanizing area plan. Developers are um, developers have have utilized numerous local experts. So we've spent a lot of time. Again, we talked about the number of studies we've done. Uh, planning staff recommendation for approval. Again, we've changed our our process over the last ten months to meet the need that the planning staff, the planning commission, and the neighbors have uh, have to, have mentioned to us. Um, we've had so many collaborative discussions with our neighbors over the last nine to 10 months. We've answered over 200 questions and, uh, and offered um, a number of pieces of information. Um, robust drainage design that will re reduce the effects over 80%, which given pictures of local and recent storms is obviously very needed and a density that is consistent with or lower than the surrounding developments. Um, again, a key focus is the county highway has really spent a lot of time with us on this. And Paul has mentioned in previous meetings, to quote him, has gone, we've, that we, he believes we've gone above and beyond here to, to allow this, uh, this development to not impact, to neg not significantly negatively impact the, uh, the local neighborhood um, traffic situation. I believe, Jackie, if you go to the next slide, there's a few pieces of information to back up. Um, we can touch on some of them if you guys have additional, if you ladies have additional questions. Um, but for now, um, we would love any questions, any other additional things that we can answer. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Let's see if we have um, comments or questions from my colleagues, uh, Commissioner Jones. Oh, you are muted. I'm afraid I'm never going to learn about that. Um, I'd like to start out by apologizing for getting up and leaving a couple of times. I was actually listening to you the whole time. I just have a couple of very rambunctious dogs who I couldn't hear you if I didn't do something about them. No, no problem. Um, First of all, I, I would like to know who is going to maintain the park and the pocket parks and all of those. Sure. So right now, um, our plan is that that will be the HOA. Um, we, we will have a homeowners association. Um, Mike Carmen, who I believe is, is on the call, uh, could probably speak to a little bit more, if, if you don't mind, Mike, about the, the teeth that we plan on putting into the um, HOA agreements. Um, this has been something we've talked about um, Commissioner Jones a number of times with the Planning Commission. Uh, we, we do believe that this is very, very, very doable um, and very manageable. Um, we've looked at the insurance issues. We've looked at a number of issues associated with this. And uh, we do believe that it is, is very manageable. Now, we are, of course, open to and have told the, the county parks and rec department if that's something that they would be interested in taking over or working with us on, we are very open to that as well. So I'd say that we're open to any any um, spectrum, but very capable of handling it on our own. Thank you. Um, I understand that the layout that you've been showing us is by no means definite. That's right. But um, you say you've been very consistent with the layout and the, so I guess I have to assume that that probably is what you're going to, or something very close to that is what you're going to end up with. And I was wondering exactly how big the dog park was going to be. Sure. Um, I believe, and I, I don't want to misquote you, so I can, I can get you this information um, in detail, but I believe it's approximately um, between a half and one acre um, of, of space. I see. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then finally, and maybe this is really something that the Homeowners Association will decide eventually, but I'm a little curious about the community gardens. Do you anticipate providing water for them? And um, usually areas like that need some preparation in the spring that many people are not able to do all on their own. Sure. Um, I was wondering if there are any plans to actually make the community garden usable. 
Great. So that's a great question. Um, the answer of water is yes. Um, so again, just like the parks, the plan will be that the utilities will be provided to all of these areas, the dog park, the, the community park, the local gardens. Um, so there will be not only power, not only water, but probably also, also power would be the plan. Um, so that would be managed by the HOA. Um, our hope is, and our, you know, our hope was that, again, being around Monroe County a lot, we see a lot of these types of things around the county um, and around the city. So our hope is that there'd be a collective group of, of people who in the, in the community that would want to take that on themselves. Um, and we would make sure that there's funds set aside in the HOA to support that. Um, so so that, that is our intent. Of course, you know, best laid plans. Um, who, who knows how it's gonna actually land out, but um, the intent would be that we would set it up for success and hope that the residents in the community want to use it and see it as an asset. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, if that, hopefully that answers your question. More or less. Um, all right, at this point, I think I'll. I think Commissioner Givens has a whole lot more questions, <laughs> and I'll turn it over to her for the time being. Thank you very much for your questions, Commissioner Givens. Well, as, as you can imagine, we've we've heard from a lot, a lot of people on on some of this, and so a lot of questions have been raised. Um, first of all. What do you consider the um, income price points for people that would be buying here, especially since you advertised this in the paper as being homes that will be starting at 200000 and yet in today's uh, presentation, you indicate the homes will start at 300000 Sure. So um, I'll pass it over to Donnie in the last, but let me, let me answer the, first, the, the second piece of that question first. Um, when we originally um, advertised this in the paper, I think you're speaking of months ago. No, um, I'm talking was... about today. Um, I don't believe in, in the paper today. It says 200, but if it does, that that might be a, yeah. a mistake. Um, and yesterday and the day before. Yep. Um, it might be a carryover from previous. The intent of 200,000 was when we were going for a PUD or an HR rezone, um, which would allow us about 160 homes, which would then we would be able to provide, um, again, a more diverse home environment there, uh, more maybe duplexes, et cetera, that you could sell um, for you could build um, and sustainably build for in the 200s. So that was, um, if that's in there in the paper still uh, this this week, um, please accept my apologies. Um, we, we try not to be inconsistent. Um, obviously we're managing a lot of things here. So if, if that is inconsistent, we apologize. Um, but that was, that was from previous um, when we were petitioning for an HR rezone. Now that we are petitioning from an MR rezone, those are some of the things that, that we had to give up, um, not because we wanted to, but because that was what we were, um, you know, working to get a compromise on with uh, with both the the commissioners and or the uh, the planning commission and the uh, the planning staff. But all as far as what's affordable, I'll let Ms. Mr. Atkins handle that. Yeah, I think I can jump. I think I can answer that question pretty easily, Commissioner. Uh, so we've done a lot of background to make sure what is attainable and not as part of the business plan, and uh, and we've spoken to many banks, and they've all been consistent that. Uh, that a family with $100,000 income could easily afford a house uh, around $350,000. So, you know, we basically assumed, you know, um, uh, a couple making about 50,000 each per year that these homes would be very attainable for. Um, well, that's, that's higher than the median family income uh, in Indiana and higher than the median family income uh, for four in Monroe County even. Um, and, I, I was actually in touch with um, Deborah Meyerson, who is part of our Affordable Housing Commission and used to head the Southern Indiana um, Housing. I can't think of the name, I'm sorry. But she said that you take the pre-tax income um, for somebody, you reduce it by the amount of uh, federal taxes that they pay, and then you multiply that final amount by two and a half as, as the factor. Uh, the median family income in Indiana right now is a, a little bit less than $92,000. If you take off just even 15% for taxes, which is pretty generous, um, and multiply that by two and a half, you get uh, a family that could afford something um, 
just under 200,000, not at 300,000. And so I, I don't trust your numbers. And I've, I've also looked at things like at the IU Credit Union and things like that in terms of what it is. And, and that housing is not just the price of the mortgage. It also is the HOA fee. It's the utility fee. It's the um, homeowner's um, insurance and property taxes. So there's a lot that has to go into that, not just the, the price of what or what the mortgage is. Um, You're certainly right, Commissioner. And, and as Kevin mentioned, it was our desirable or our desire early on to build more houses to achieve a, a lower price point. But that's not what you're presenting here. No, I know, uh, of course not. And, uh, and, and in order to get the planning staff uh, approval, we had to compromise with a lower number. Uh, we, we would love to provide more homes at lower prices, but with the MRE zone, um, the most we can do is that, and hence the price point that comes out of it. I we understand that, but it's, being, it but it's be being marketed to middle-class people, and that's not who this will really, who will live there, and I find that offensive. Um, well, we can certainly provide you more data for more banks if you'd like. That's okay. My husband's a PhD economist. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, one of the things I think I saw in one of, and there's been a lot of, of paperwork with all this, as, as you all have, have acknowledged. Um, I think that I saw something that, that the developers were going to do something sort of create a sort of an escrow fund for the, um, to help with the maintenance of the detention ponds and maybe even some of the initial utilities yep. for the dog park and stuff like that. Yes. A reserve. Thank you. Um, how big is that reserve? Well, as we get further along and our engineering folks establish how much it's required to, to maintain this and longevity, we'll establish it then. Um, we don't have that exact number now, but uh, we certainly will have that and we will certainly make sure that's part of our funding and that's handed off. That, that reserve of cash is handed off to the residents which is typical for all new neighborhoods now that have HOAs. So, so I think that maybe just if I can answer that a little bit, the, the, the commitment that we are making is that once, because obviously the, the final design is not done, um, once the final design is done, we'll have a better idea of what the maintenance costs would be over the course of, say, 10 to 15 years. Uh, and the plan would be the reserve would be able to handle that maintenance cost. So there's a... I believe a, uh, an operations and owners and operations manual the, the, the development provides to the county drainage department um, that they use to then manage that, uh, that, that drainage. And in there, it would talk about how long you would need to and what you would need to do over that time period. And so the, the reserve would be able to fund that, that project. And, and um, I don't know if this is a question for you or for uh, planning or who... Who would ensure that the proper amount is put into that reserve? I mean, I think it would be us making that commitment, um, but we would obviously get feedback from the drainage board to make sure that they are um, they are aligned with that. But again, this is this is probably one of those things that people are going to say you can't we you know you can't say that we're going to guarantee it, but we are we're, I guess giving you our word that that is our plan and our intent, um, and uh, and I think you know, it's willing to sign up for anything more significant than that. But uh, I'm not sure that this process allows that. So. I just want to step in here, which is unusual for me. I'm sorry to do this, uh, pardon me. But uh, if there's anything like this, uh, Commissioner Giffins, that you are um, concerned about, we would, we would need to go through a process called a written commitment um, because um, that's, that's, how, that's how we roll in, uh, <laughs> in planning. So we would, we would, so if, if there's an interest in that, we, we will need to talk about that. And, and if I may, Commissioner Thomas, we, we, um, we offered that during the planning commission to offer a number of written commitments um, throughout this process uh, for a number of things that we've, we've committed to. So very happy to do that. I, I appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure that Commissioner Gitsons was aware of the process um, because this is not typically when we get planning petitions, they have written commitments already completed. And it's, it's yes, um, while you can offer that, it's something that we would wanna have in place before 
um, uh, we took a vote on on this petition, if that's the desire of this board. Um, so, um, so the other one of the other things that is here is that we have um, some high voltage um, power lines running across the property. And of course that those there's easements that go with this. So mm -hmm. are these high voltage, extra high voltage or ultra high voltage lines that run across there, do you know? Um, I, I believe that they are, they're high voltage transmission lines, but, but I am not, I am not hundred percent sure the definition between high voltage, extra high voltage or ultra high voltage to be entirely honest. Okay, just it it does have it, to do you with you can it. tell me if there's a if there's a specific voltage that you know that, that indicates one versus the other, but I think majority of transmission lines are are um, managed at a, at the same voltage. So um, i'm I'm again happy to go back and look at that in detail, but I've um, worked with transmission lines for a long time, and i've I, I didn't if if you tell me that if you're talking over thirteen thirteen eight kV, or a thousand voltage, or you know whatever whatever the uh, whatever the number is. If if you define what ultra versus that is, I'm happy to to answer that okay, question. Well, if, then just tell me what the KB is for those lines, if you know that. I, I don't. I don't okay. know that. Um, so but we do have a, we do have some slides. I don't know if you if you'd like to pull it up, Jackie. Um, we we did put a slide together on the uh, the transmission lines and some of the perceived um, health and 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 did some research so if it didn't come up uh, two weeks ago as a concern of yours but if, if it's something that we are concerned with we, we have that information in there if you'd like to look at it um so um what are are there i didn't have a chance to do really deep deep dive because we've got a few other things on our plates too, but um, are there health risks to uh, children or pregnant women from living near these kinds of high voltage lines? There's there's a lot of research that's been done um, by the US government and um, by independent studies that have shown that there is no credible, um, credible link between the two. That there is danger if there's a bad storm and the lines come down, right? Um, sure, that's possible, but I, I don't have a single um, event. There are protection, um, trans, transformers and breakers and such that protect um, something like that. So before the line would hit the ground, um, it's, it's not like, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's it, it, there, there are safety systems in place on transmission lines that prevent something like that from happening um, and, and hurting people below. Sorry, I'm, I'm just looking through my notes here. Um, so will the, um, you have to put in, you know, streets here and stuff. Will they have street lights and will they be built to county? Um, yeah, so because we're not asking for any exceptions in the MR rezone, um, we will be following all zoning ordinances associated with, uh, with Monroe County zoning ordinance. Okay, well, I'd, I'd like to hear from the, public and then perhaps raise other issues if that's okay later. Thank you. Thank sure. you. We can do that. Um, so I'm a little concerned because it is 1230. We've been at this an hour and 15 minutes and we haven't heard from the public yet. Uh, but I have not eaten yet today. I really need to go get something. So um, if we could have 10 minutes, I would really appreciate it. My colleagues would, would um, be okay with that. All right, okay. So we're gonna take a 10 minute uh, recess and we'll come back at 12.42 um, and I will be um, less hangry and- <laughs> if, we need, if we can send you some food, just let us know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all right, thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna grab an apple, I'll be much happier. And then, um, and then we'll come back and we will hear from the and we'll do another round of questions. Comments. So thank you for your patience, everyone. <laughs> we'll be right back. Uh, we're recessed until. I'm going to call us back to order.
Uh, and the next thing that uh, we should hear is a uh, uh, comment from those who support uh, this petition and uh, a reminder that you will have just three minutes uh, to speak. And at two minutes and 30 seconds, you will hear a tone telling you that you have 30 seconds remaining. Um, this isn't a um, time for back and forth conversation. This is just time to hear from the who wish to speak in first in favor of this petition, and then we will hear from those opposing later. Um, so let's go ahead and see. Um, it looks like we have some hands raised. Let me get back out here. There we go. Um, we have Deborah Meyerson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, hope everybody is feeling a little more sated from a quick bite. Uh, I appreciate the due diligence that the commissioners are taking on this um, uh, proposal for rezoning. And I'd like to strongly encourage you to support Ordinance 2021-36 to rezone um, the request for 4691 South Victor Pike for the trails at Robertson Farms. Um, Monroe County's efforts to achieve a more equitable, affordable, and ambitious envisioned in the 2012 Comprehensive Plan are admirable. This project offers an excellent opportunity to put policy into practice. Um, I'm proud that the comp plan has this vision and we just need the zoning to align with that. The housing scarcity in Monroe County is pushing home and land prices up further all the time. And while I appreciate that Commissioner Githens reached out to me recently about how to calculate housing affordability in Monroe County, um, and I gave a rough overview. I also noted that a suitable analysis for commissioner's policy decisions needs to be more complex than what I could provide in a brief explanation. Um, it's just not possible with current land values and construction costs in Monroe County to build new construction market rate single family homes at sales prices that are affordable to 100% median family income. You can do that with subsidy, with all the housing that's needed, or you can do it with adding to housing supply. And the housing supply in Monroe County has been lagging for the last decade, and it needs to be boosted. And this project offers an opportunity to do that. The land use decisions made now will affect Monroe County for generations to come, determining who can afford to live here and who is pushed out. Approving this rezoning request is an important opportunity to realize the goals of the 2012 Monroe County Comprehensive Plan and to meet the needs of people who want to live here today. So I appreciate the commissioner's consideration and appreciate the discussion that you're generating. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate your comments. Um, next we have um, Daniel Butler. Can you guys hear me okay? Sure can. Um, I was just going to follow up to that high um, transmission line question. We do have that data with us. That, that is 138 kBA um, transmission line going through there, and we do have the uh, guidelines given for that particular kind. Um, and so they just call that a high voltage transmission line. It is not ultra high or extra um, high in that area. Um, so we are given um, setbacks. So no structures can be built um, with a minimum of 50 feet around those lines. But of course we would like to go beyond that to keep um, possible other concerns close to them or anything, but we do have guidelines given by Duke Energy on how that works. So that's all I was to add and answer that question that was raised earlier. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next we have Alice. Good afternoon. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not in favor, so I need to talk later. Yes, okay. 
Um, next, we have um, Greg Alexander. <clears throat> Great. Um, thanks. My name is Greg Alexander. Um, just trust I'll, I'll get to the point here. Um, there's a citizen in Bloomington named Mark Stosberg. Uh, he's got a background in GIS, and he's been putting together maps to try to help the city prioritize sidewalk investments. His latest product is a map he calls Walk Potential. Um, it shows where there's a combination of residences and destinations like grocery stores close to each other um, based on his own analysis. And it's where people would walk for a lot of their trips, if there were good local places, highlights, low hanging fruit for sidewalk and trail projects or any project that might improve um, grid connectivity. His map obviously has a huge blob around downtown Bloomington and IU campus. And there's a big blob on the east side where there are so many apartments close to College Mall. And then there's two more on the west side and the south side. These two correspond to the exact same areas identified by the Monroe County Urbanizing Area Plan. In a sense, he independently verified the data that the county already paid consultants to collect in that plan. When the city had our debate about allowing duplexes in core neighborhoods, one of the things I heard over and over is we should be building village nodes, village nodes in someone else's backyard where people can live in a dense, sustainable and walkable development that isn't necessarily right by downtown or campus. And this is exactly what the county urbanizing area plan suggests for Clear Creek and for West Third Street, the same areas that, that Mark's map shows. Um, honestly, I'm not crazy about this proposal. The two proposals you already rejected for land east of this parcel were much much better. The trails, much like Westbrook Downs on State Road 46, where I grew up. But can you imagine how different my childhood would have been if there had been a trail connection on the backside of Westbrook Downs instead of being entirely islanded by the highway? This project is a lot better than a lot of other things we were building. Why do we even have the urbanizing area plan if you guys aren't listening to it? Was the money spent on that consultant just pork barrel wasted money? Thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, we have. Oh gosh, I cannot read the name. Um, a and Andrea, I'm not sure. Um, you'll have to give us your name, please. Good afternoon. Why I'm not Andrea uh, Sin. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you give us your yes. name, please? Your screen name's not, not Okay, my name is Christine Andresen. Ah, that's your last name, got it, yes. thank you. <laughs> and my maiden name is Robertson, and my parents um, are Don and Jan Robertson. My mom, Jan Robertson, owns the property and still lives in Monroe County. My mom has lived in Monroe County for more than 60 years, and I lived in Monroe County for more than 30 years. I visit Monroe County often multiple times each year. And although I don't live in Monroe County, I love Monroe County. I went to Clear Creek Elementary School. I went to Bachelor Middle School. I went to Bloomington High School South. And I graduated from Indiana University with a bachelor's and a master's in education. I love Monroe County. I also love the property at Victor Pike. And I loved growing up there. Growing up there, my parents always told me it was a good location to grow. It was also the perfect place to share with others in Monroe County. My father pointed out to us that there was access to Victor Pike, and although that is not considered to be frontage, he had reasons that he thought it would be a good development. He also pointed out that it would be important in years to come that we connected to the sewer so that eventually it could be something we could share with others in Monroe County. So all along the way, I was hearing that this would be a great place to share. And then the trails went in and it became even more evident that it would be an ideal place for many to enjoy the trails and many amenities in Monroe County. So I'm here today to just let you know that. And in a different way, I'd like to point out that I am sort of the voice of the need for attainable housing. I don't live in Monroe County, but I am a professional and I have recently moved to a very similar neighborhood. And although it may seem expensive, blessing to be able to find attainable housing because I needed it. In a way it's humbling to have to admit that I can't afford a McMansion, 
but this is the price point that my husband and I could afford. And I feel like it's needed in Monroe County. As a matter of fact, I know it's needed because I have friends and family in Monroe County that have not been able to outbid or locate property to buy. I had a um, family member who had to buy in a neighboring county in order to find attainable housing. So I hope that you can find a way to make this development happen. And I hope that it can bless many, many people in Monroe County. Thank you so much for your commitment to overseeing Monroe County's needs and for being wise with this land. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Andreasen. Um, next up is Dave Warren. Can you hear me? We sure can. All yeah, right, you. thank you. I just got out of teaching a class on, on local government finance, no less. Um, so I haven't heard um, anything that was discussed until about a minute ago. Um, but I would just like to make a, a few points. Um, I think this is a great opportunity for Monroe County. Um, I, I think one thing that I really want to stress is that this is in an area where we have some incredible uh, community investments, and, and some of these investments are quite large. We've got Bachelor Middle School, we've got Clear Creek, Clear Creek Elementary, uh, the Clear Creek Trail, which connects to the Beeline Trail. Um, we've got the coming uh, Southwest Monroe County Public Library with our Monroe County, you know, Monroe County Public uh, sorry, Monroe County Council uh, issued bonds to, to help pay for that, that branch. And it would be a shame if we only allow, you know, what current zoning allows there, which is 32 very large, very expensive homes on one acre lots. Uh, that would be not making uh, an efficient use of these, these fantastic investments in our families. Uh, you know, 125 homes, that's potentially 125 families that could live there a lot cheaper than if these are 32 uh, homes at 500 or 600 or $700,000. Um, and if you recall, uh, these home builders actually initially had a proposal that called for, for more homes, more housing types, and they would have been even cheaper. Um, and the county didn't, didn't want that. Um, also want to make another point you know, this is in an area, um, annexation area 1B, um, which was, you know, city council did vote 6-3 to, to annex that area. Um, if, you know, and if remonstrance is, is not made, um, then this will go to the, to the city. And so, you know, there could be the, the potential for the folks who are against this to have something that is far more dense than 125 homes. So um, I hope you, you take all of those, those things into account. Um, it's very hard to find housing here. Uh, when there isn't enough homes, uh, home sellers get to name their price. Um, they get to name their rents. Uh, that's what we've got going on here. And so I, I hope you can make a, a decision that, that um, really maximizes on, on the value of these fantastic investments we've made in our families in this area. Um, and this is exactly what the comp plan calls for in this area, mixed residential. Um, so uh, if you could please stick for all of the people of Monroe County, whether they live in the city or the county, all 140,000 of them are um, your constituents. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Warren. And next we have uh, Andy. Good afternoon. Name, please. Sure. Uh, thank you. I was just uh, really glad the difference in affordable housing as it pertains to a governmental agency uh, versus, uh, you know, free market housing, so to speak. Um, and also to the uh, information that the uh, petitioners had provided earlier about how much money somebody had to make in terms of a, a family income, in terms of what, uh, you know, the, a house they could buy through a conventional loan program was absolutely accurate. Uh, anybody making about $100,000, uh, you know, assuming good credit, things of that nature, they're gonna be able to spend about a 350 house. Um, the average price of a house just this last month in August in Monroe County was $292,000. So, you know, what is middle class exactly when, um, you know, the average home this last month was 292. I think that middle class extends, you know, below and above that number. Um, I'm a real estate broker. And if somebody asked me, hey, what's middle class in our town right now? In my head, 
the number that would pop into my head would be 250 to 400, you know, somewhere in that range. Um, and you know, that takes into account uh, previously uh, built homes, but new construction, you know, it's, it's pretty much impossible to bring it bring anything other than a townhome in under 250 right now so you know we have to look at the reality of what costs are and you know what middle you know our pricing our pricing continues to go up because we don't have enough supply so we're going to have to change the supply equation to you know make it have any difference in what's going on in our county right now also too uh, i wanted to point out that uh, the same power lines that run through this property they run through clear creek estates and eagle view to the north and you know i don't know of any issue uh, in the 25 years I've been a realtor that's ever, you know, come out of that with the health problems or, um, you know, issues with the lines hurting people or anything like that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Um, all right. I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, so next we will turn to um, those who uh, wish to speak in opposition to this petition. You could raise your hand um, in the Zoom screen or star nine uh, if you're on your phone. Doesn't look like we have a lot of people on the phone. Um, first, we have Guy Lofman. Good afternoon and thanks for your patience. Um, I think Alice was first actually. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see her hand. Okay, sorry. Um, Alice, we'll just have Mr. Lofman be even more patient. <laughs> Alice, good afternoon again, and thank you for your patience. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I think we're kind of doing the emperor's clothes here. If the comparison to this uh, development is Winslow Farms, then of course it's urban sprawl. Uh, and I don't hear anything very, very... Um, progressive, oh, I don't want to use that word in a different term. I don't hear anything very um, advanced about how they're going to show that they are encouraging being careful with the environment. For instance, pervious roads instead of impervious roads in the area. I'm concerned by the fact that we don't know who the builder is. We don't know the quality. You just say high quality. I would also like to point out that a plan that was made in 2012 could change with the times and should change with the times. I also very much question the walkable aspect of this as far as implying that you would be able to live without your, your using your car very, car very much. I challenge the uh, developer who has four children for you and your wife to go on your bikes or walk and get your groceries to sustain your family for a week. Um, I also thank Commissioner Gibbons for, Giffins for, to me, clarifying the affordability of this sprawling, urban sprawl development. If you're interested in not making your urban sprawl and density, please think about rehabbing the areas of, within Bloomington that are in need of rehabbing. Then you'll be close to everything. Then you'll have your density. This is the country. We want to have a different plan for the country. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Again, thank you for your patience um, and your willingness to stay on. Okay, uh, Guy Lofman, again, I apologize to you for putting you off for a few minutes, but thank you, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Guy Lofman. Our family has lived at 4835 South Victor Pike, right next to the Robertson farm for over 40 years. I would like to address four topics. First, traffic. Victor Pike is barely 20 feet wide from the Robertson farm to Church Lane. Paul Saddley told me that the last actual Victor Pike vehicle count in that stretch showed 1,035 vehicles per day. The trails anticipates 125 lots. Common rule of thumb is 12 per trips per lot per day. And a trip in, includes driving out and back in. 
So that's 24 vehicles per day per lot on Victor Pike. 125 lots times 24 vehicles makes 3,000 vehicles per day. That basically quadruples the vehicle count from 1,000 vehicles to 4,000 vehicles per day. The 25 lots that are practical under RE1 zoning would lead to an additional 600 vehicles a day. That increase of over 50% would stretch the functional capacity of this narrow, hilly, curvy country road as much as should be allowed. Quadrupling the vehicle count would overwhelm Victor Pike. Second, the housing market. Petitioner says the Monroe County has a healthy market for houses over 600,000 and the current RE zoning would allow houses to be built in that range. The proceeds to the Robertson family would apparently be about the same if the, far houses, if the farm is developed with fewer houses on larger lots. The negative impact on the environment and neighborhood would be much less. Third, trees. A sapling is not the equivalent of a mature tree. Petitioners propo propose destroying hundreds of mature trees in the building and retention pond areas and replacing them with saplings. That hurts the air and the water and the wildlife and the beauty of this area. Do not be swayed by this false equivalency. Finally, the big picture. Bloomington has a unique, wonderful mix of urban and rural virtues. The city has gone all in on high density. It is up to the Board of Commissioners to preserve the rural qualities that make our county so appealing. The adjoining residential properties are all RE1. Don't leapfrog over them. Stop urban sprawl and preserve the rural nature of this vital part of Monroe County. Please keep the RE1 zoning at 4691 South Victor Pike. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Laughlin. Next, we have Patty and Dave uh, Bush, and each of you will have three minutes, um, or one of you will have three minutes, depending on who's on the call. Can you hear me? We sure can. Can you uh, give us your name, and, and you'll have three minutes. Will do. Good day, commissioners. My name is Patty Bush. I live south of this petition site and I oppose REZ-21-1. This opposition stems from Clear Creek's critical watershed and its increasing propensity to flood our property and properties upstream and downstream. The photos included in your packets depict the high waters and damages from February 2019 and June 2021 rainfall events. All roads surrounding REZ-21-1 were flooded. This petition site on a very steep hill proposes seven acres of impervious road surface and approximately 125 units with rooftops, driveways, and sidewalks. The proposed detention basins designed to meet the standard requirement only capture and slow peak flow release for Q100 events. They will not decrease the volume of runoff flowing into Clear Creek. The MS4 coordinator stated March 17, 2021, this infrastructure is not designed to hold rain events that exceed Q100. Similar to the rainfall of 2019 and 2021, and it's not, quote, practical, unquote, to build larger infrastructure. If it's unrealistic to build infrastructure large enough to capture rainfall events of five inches plus or more, then limit the density and impervious surface that contribute to increased volume and velocity of stormwater runoff and flooding. Improved critical watershed mitigation on this site would include less density like RE1. Less density would mean 85 fewer homes, more green space, mature trees, wildlife, habitat, and less stormwater runoff. There are other factors contributing to Clear Creek's rising waters, such as climate change, deforestation, dense development, and the confluence of Clear Creek, West Clear Creek, and Jackson Creek, all within one half mile. Also, within two years, Bloomington's Hidden River Pathway Project would drain stormwater much faster 
into Clear Creek due to larger culverts. The future of Clear Creek and neighboring properties are at stake. Responsible planning is needed when developing Monroe County, and that includes minimizing flood damage to the county's residents. Please vote no to this petition and maintain the best of our rural community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dave, are you also speaking or? Yes. Okay, yes. please, uh, please proceed. Thank you so much. Give us your name, even though I just did. Thank you, Commissioner Thomas. Uh, I'm Dave Bush and for the past 22 years, I've lived at 1250 West Church Lane. I'm an adjacent property owner to the petition site, which is currently and appropriately zoned RE1. The commissioner's packets include over 125 letters of remonstrance against this proposed development. Of those, 60 are from fellow property owners who live adjacent to or within one half mile of the petition site. Common themes have emerged from these objections, which center around density, traffic, and noise. Other valid and documented concerns are the impacts of development in the Clear Creek critical watershed, including flooding, increased stormwater runoff from increased impervious surfaces in the watershed, and increased stream and groundwater pollution. I have concerns about the private ownership and maintenance of the fire hydrant system in the proposed development. Placing the operation and maintenance costs of the fire hydrant system onto the homeowners association in conjunction with the cost of maintaining the detention systems, streets, sidewalks, storm sewers, and home exteriors seems excessive and could push the O&M costs to a point where the temptation may be to defer maintenance or not do it at all. An additional neighborhood concern has increased traffic during the construction phase and beyond. With construction starting on nearby sites, we are already experiencing high volumes of dump trucks and cement trucks racing up and down Church Lane and Victor Pike. Approving the construction of 125 new homes risks overwhelming the existing road network with the addition of an estimated 1500 vehicle trips per day onto Victor Pike. And I do have a question that uh, maybe the commissioners could raise. Has a traffic study been conducted by the Monroe County Highway Department on Victor Pike and the Victor Pike that road intersection? It was expressed to us that the only traffic study in the area was done by a private firm hired to study the Southern Meadows project and that the study was focused on the Rogers Street, that road intersection, and not Victor Pike. Given the many concerns that neighbors, county residents, and the Planning Commission have expressed about this project, we believe lower density is appropriate. Less is more. Please vote no on REZ 21-1. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, next, we have Margaret Clements. Dr. Clements, good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners, and uh, thank you for hearing me today. And I also would like to thank the petitioners for honoring me so much in their, um, in their representations of what I've said and what I believe is important, that we need more single family housing and more affordable housing uh, in Bloomington. But um, that being said, uh, as far as single family housing is concerned, it should not be uh, built and marketed in such a way that jeopardizes the life and treasure of our fellow community members. Um, I used to be a mortgage loan officer and I do know that homeowners association fees are factored into the uh, into the estimation of whether or not a homeowner can actually um, uh, afford to pay for the housing costs they're about to sign their uh, future earnings in order to um, pay back. We don't really know how much the homeowners association fees would be in this community that they propose to build, but there seems to be a growing list of costs, uh, you know, deferred to the homeowners association. A robust drainage system, I would imagine that that costs more to maintain than a regular drainage system. Uh, we have a lot of homeowner association failure in and around Monroe County. And those costs eventually come to the taxpayers. And as a taxpayer, I would be opposed to this project because it would uh, potentially fall uh, to us to repair 
things that the homeowners uh, thought they could afford, but wound up not being able to afford. We uh, have uh, in our community a number of people who have appeared uh, over and over again, who've been beating the drumbeat for more and more affordable housing. And we bought into that. We've densified the city. We built a whole lot of maybe 7,000 multifamily units within the last three years, much higher numbers than we uh, estimated that we need. And at some moment, uh, when you're beating the drumbeat of housing scarcity, you must reconcile what you have proposed and built and with what is being built with what a new estimate of need is. So I, um, I question, you know, I question kind of this circle, the wagons and the same players always coming before us, beating the same drumbeat, you know, representing out of town builders primarily. And uh, I think that we need to protect our resources, protect what is precious to us. And one of those uh, is, our, is our rural character. We've bought into the density as Guy Loftman said. Well, let us now prevent urban sprawl. And this is where we need to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Glass. Uh, next, we have uh, Kathy Crabtree. Good afternoon. Hi, um, I missed my opportunity to speak in support of. Should I wait till the very end if I want to speak in support of this rezoning? Um, no, we've already passed that. Um, if if you can make a brief statement, um, we'll go ahead and with my colleagues approval, we'll go ahead and accept it now. Is that all right? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very sorry. That's okay. Okay, um, I support the proposed rezoning request um, for a number of reasons that have already been said, but this location is within walking or bike, biking distance to several major public investments. Um, Clear Creek Elementary School, Bachelor Middle School, the Clear Creek Trail, among other things. And I think someone mentioned the new uh, library branch. Um, it's great that we, and, or I mean, I encourage you to support the increased uh, number of homes because we wanna offer this opportunity to as many folks as possible, not just those folks who can afford a McMansion on a one acre lot. Um, regarding some of the environmental issues that were raised, um, the county's own trained scientists and stormwater entities confirmed that this proposal will reduce the stormwater runoff in the area. Um, there was some debate about whether these homes would be $200,000 or $300,000, but surely we can all agree that either one of those price points is more affordable than the currently allowed 32 homes on one acre lots. Um, so I just wanna um, thank you for taking my comment late and I hope that you will vote to support this. Uh, the lack of homes in the city and county is leading to higher prices and rents that is requiring folks to uh, find housing outside of Monroe County. And that is sending tax revenue that we could have to neighboring counties. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Crabtree. Uh, next, we have uh, Jim Stainbrook. Good afternoon. Thank you for your patience. Yes, uh, thank you, commissioners. Uh, having heard mention several times of homeowners association, I'd like to add anecdotally that as we resided in Florida for a number of years, we had personal experience with homeowners. I realize Sarasota is not Bloomington or this area, uh, but homeowners associations are not always effective to say the least. I know in our case there on Lido Beach, uh, people were reluctant to uh, spend money. Fortunately, our building didn't collapse. Then on Victor Pike itself, last week as Barbara and I drove into Bloomington, I actually counted 12 cars backed up uh, from the uh, service station uh, to Highway 37, indicating that at least on some occasions, there is a, a traffic jam. Um, and so Victor Pike's a concern. Uh, then thirdly, and perhaps just by way of clarification, I believe Mr. Wilson, Director of Planning, uh, very uh, concisely uh, offers some caveats. Uh, later on, one of the petitioners talked of support. It really isn't my understanding, and perhaps at the same time this is editorial, but I don't think that the planning department intends, 
And I, as a side note, I want to thank uh, Mrs. Payne for presenting a very lucid and effective presentation, but I didn't feel that she was promoting or actively advocating uh, the approval of this uh, petition. Uh, the planning department made a recommendation, which was certainly given, and I'm sure, or at least I feel, I think I'm sure that the commissioners today are attending carefully to what planning has said. But uh, I, I, I hope, and this would be subject to Larry's uh, wording, of course, but I think supporting uh, in the sense of advocating or promoting is different than uh, promoting, <laughs> pardon me, different than offering a recommendation. Thank you, commissioners. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Mr. Steinbrook. We appreciate you. Let's see if there's any other uh, comments in opposition to this petition. Okay, let's go ahead and do another round of uh, if there are additional questions from uh, the board for uh, the planning department, the petitioner, petitioner's uh, representatives. Uh, Commissioner Jones, you're muted. Never fails. <laughs> Is this the time to make comments or um, will that be later? Let's, um, let's do questions first, if that's okay. Would that be all right uh, with you? Yeah, I'll defer to Commissioner Givens then. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Givens? You're muted. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, I would send a comment in the chat that uh, something that on page 167 of 182 in the package, my package is much longer than 182 pages, first of all, but also it, it addresses HOA reserve. That does not tell me a number. It does not even tell me a percentage. Uh, purchase price is whatever. It, it, it's not a commitment. Sure. It's not a written uh, commitment. If I may, Commissioner, I think what I mentioned was that getting a number at this time was very difficult. And so I think if I read it, I'll read it, what it says, it says a fully funded reserve to cover required maintenance and capital improvements. And so I believe what I stated was that we would be very happy to commit to the intent of that number, but providing a number right now is very inappropriate for us to do. Um, but we have committed to the intent of that. Um, so I, I believe that's what I was, if I, if I, if I misspoke earlier, I, I believe that's what I tried to say. Um, I hope that that meets your intent. Um, we, we, if you'd like us to give you a number, we of course can, but that number is by definition going to be wrong. Um, and then we will defer to the actual final details once we have that idea of capital improvement necessary, and then we will commit to that. And so we've committed to, I think, the intent of what you're looking for without providing a number that doesn't have relevance. And if I, and if I might, um, I think a, a written commitment would um, would not necessarily need to have a number, but it would need to clearly, uh, because yeah, the, you clearly wouldn't have that right now, but it would clearly need to uh, denote and explain exactly what will be, what this fund will be used for. And then that fund would be set up before construction started or at whatever point. Um, uh, and that's possible to do, to say um, drainage maintenance and inspections and repairs and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so I don't know if that helps you at all, Commissioner Githens. What, what I don't quite get is who determines that number? You know, is it our drainage board? Is it? Yeah. We've not done this. We've not done this. Um, and, uh, um, it makes it um, very difficult because typically an HOA becomes responsible for it. And, um, and if there's a commitment made by a company that then changes hands or gets sold off or decides to close business, we, I don't see how we would have any, um, any way to make good on something is as good as the intentions are. And I'm not questioning your intentions at all, gentlemen. Um, it's just, you know, we, we've been through this um, with other uh, developments where, where we hear things uh, that sound great and the intentions are there, but they don't pan out for a number of legitimate reasons, but they're very, it's, it makes it very difficult for our planning department 
okay. um, and for our stormwater uh, departments. So. So if I, if I may, Commissioner, the, the, um, I think it is something that we talked about in the Planning Commission meetings that there is the process, the way this works with a reserve, um, any type of reserve that is developed, um, there's usually an accredited estimator that comes in and looks at the intent of that reserve and estimates what they believe the cost of that reserve is. And so it's a third party, again, to just make, to set yourself, a, you know, with some comfort that it's a third party, not necessarily us or the county, both all of us would have input into it. Um, but that's the way reserves work. Um, we, we've been involved with them many times in the past and had very good success with them. Yeah, uh, let, let's, we're really, we're really running a very long meeting here. Um, so let's kind of keep to Q&A if, if we can. And, and I appreciate your comment though and uh, clarification. And uh, Commissioner Giffins, do you have other uh, yeah, I just, questions? I just want to clarify that um, this suggested price of three hundred to four hundred fifty thousand dollars is not a guarantee of what those prices will be. That if we were to rezone, it, the prices could be much higher. Especially right now, in the time of COVID, um, there are people that have been waiting like a year for uh, new appliances, things like that, and that really drives up the price when you're you're setting aside different monies for things. And so, the, these prices that you're talking about are just a suggestion at this point. Okay. Did you have other questions? Not at this, no, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and do a round of comments, uh, Commissioner Jones. Yes, I, I'd like to thank the plan department and the petitioners for the volumes of information that we've been given. Um, it certainly has been very interesting reading. Um, and I, I do appreciate the petitioners have clearly tried very hard to make this petition as palatable as possible. They certainly have worked hard with the plan department to bring it forward. And, and I appreciate all the work they put into it. I do still have a number of problems with it. Um, and while I know that these a number of these things seem to have been addressed, I don't think that they've been addressed in a way that is actually completely effective. Um, in particular, where drainage is concerned, I think, well, first let me say that the comp plan was written in, or was um, accepted in 2012. We have seen definite climate change since 2012. We see a whole lot more rain now. The experts say that the amount of rainfall has increased, I believe, by 16%, but it is not distributed throughout the year. That rainfall, that extra rainfall is almost all coming in the spring. And that's why we have a huge amount of flooding in the spring. Your drainage system is good for a 100 year rain event, which is commendable. Um, and I expect it probably would work for that. Yet, I think that there will be a number of events that are well over 100 year rainfall events and that will, that will not be handled by the drainage system. Um, I also have serious concerns about a homeowners association. We have had quite a bit of experience with them and one of the big problems is that these associations are made up of volunteers. Someone, people who are living there have to volunteer to be on the, to be a leader of the association and to oversee everything that, that they're charged with taking care of. That may seem fine to start out with, but as time goes on, people, the uh, fee obviously has to go up frequently because the repairs and all will become more and more expensive. People will begin to resent having that fee. They'll probably be unhappy with what the homeowners association does or doesn't do. Um, these kinds of problems just do creep up and with time, a homeowner's association becomes less and less effective. 
the escrow amount that you're talking about, you said is good for 10 to 15 years. 10 to 15 years is about when you would expect a whole lot of the infrastructure to need attention and probably very expensive attention. And I do not, I, I have no confidence that at that time it won't come to the county to have to deal with these problems at the expense of all the taxpayers in the county. I also believe that in a larger than 100 year event, people who don't live in that, in that development, people who live in the areas surrounding the development will be the ones who experience the most trouble from it. And I don't think they deserve that. I think that the people who are already here need to be taken into account. Um, I also, well, I, there's been a lot said about affordability. So much of what's talked about surrounding affordability and how you accomplish affordability and all of that is more anecdotal than anything else. Um, I can offer my own anecdote. I know a, a couple who recently decided to move back to Monroe County for retirement and immediately found a house that they bought for 135,000 that suited their needs perfectly. If you look at Zillow regularly, you will find that there are almost always houses available for under $200,000 many of whom, many of which um, actually offer amenities beyond what's likely to occur here. Um, the, so many of the people that we've heard from in support of this, and we of course hear from people outside of the meetings a whole lot, um, the people who are supporting it tend to be people who will financially benefit from more and more people coming to the county. That is, well, and then the people who are not in support of it are almost exclusively people who already live in the county and who have established their lives here. And basically, I think that it's very important that we think about the people who are here rather than the people who might come here. Um, let me see. It's only in the last 30 to 40 years that this kind of development has become so pervasive and popular. Before then, the way the vast majority of development occurred was that people bought a plot of land and they built themselves, whatever housing they could afford to build on that land. We're being told that you will be forced to build houses that are half a million dollars if we don't agree with, with this. I do not believe that there is anything that can force you to build houses that are that much. Certainly that is the way you can have the highest profit, which of course is what you're looking for. But helping people who are involved in land development increase their profits, maximize their profits, isn't necessarily the role of government. And we need to think much more about the situation as it is now, the people who are here now, and how they're going to be affected in the future. I'm also concerned that there's quite a bit more undeveloped developers who buy that land will use all the same arguments you're using, which will put even pressure on everything surrounding it. And I have to ask, where does this stop? How long do we continue to say, oh, this is right next to the city, so it's not rural anymore, so it needs to be developed more densely because that just moves the city outward and then there's more land 
that's just right next to the city and should be developed more densely, we're told. Eventually, if this is to be the way that things go in the future, and it seems that from what we hear that that's what people intend, then eventually we have no more rural Monroe County, which the people who already live here don't want to see that. And we hear that from a vast majority of people. Um, let's see. These issues have divided the community and have caused a great deal of acrimony in the community. A lot of people are very upset and angry with us for decisions that we've made in the past. And I'm sure they will be. There will be plenty of people who are angry with us, however we decide today and every time that we're faced with this kind of decision in the future. Basically, as I've been kind of alluding to, I think it's important for elected officials to govern for the people who are here and take their concerns and their well being into consideration above those of people who might be brought here. I don't think that there are that many people in this community who are looking for new housing that is priced in those ranges. Um, I think mostly people in this count who live here now and are looking for housing are looking for something that's quite a bit more affordable than this. Um, so let's see. I also have to say, I, you quoted me about how pleased I was with the, the comp plan when we passed it. And I was and still am very pleased with the comp plan as it was passed. And the comp plan, as it was passed, determined that this property should be a state residential. I'm fine with it being a state residential. That is exactly what was intended at that time. And I would have no objections at all to it being developed in that manner. Um, I do not see this as holding up the comp plan. You're asking for a rezone. When you ask for a rezone, you're asking for the comp plan to be changed, which um, I think is not our intent. It was not the intent of the plan at the time that it was passed. So I guess I've made it pretty obvious that while I do admire your efforts and appreciate that you have tried hard to make this acceptable to the community, I don't believe it's a good fit for this community and I will be voting no. Thank you, Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Giffords. Well, I don't want to have to speak after Commissioner Jones. That was that was eloquent and, and very heartfelt. Um, I live in an area that was developed that places near me were developed after uh, we bought our own home. And we were impacted by what happened with construction that occurred in newer neighborhoods and then from living downstream from these new neighborhoods. I've lived in my home for 28 years and we've had four instances of 100 year floods. It's happening more frequently. And I think the kinds of things that we have to worry about with relation to, to climate change, um, they're here, they're real, they're now. I know that also that people living out and away from the city are going to be driving more that will increase some of the pressures on climate change. And while I would like to see this kind of development occur in town, I'm not in favor of it occurring out so far. Um, it just doesn't seem to fit with the character of what's already there. And like Commissioner Jones, I feel an obligation to uh, protect and work with the current residents as well. They purchased their properties, many of them decades ago, with the understanding that, and according to the plan that was in place, that that is how this area would be developed. So um, that's where I stand on things. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Githins. Um, I, um, um, both of you have made some um, excellent points and I just, um, I haven't asked a lot of questions today because this is my seventh or eighth um, hearing of this case and it, 
it never fails to interest me and it never fails that I find, learn something new, which is always good. Um, so, and I appreciate um, all of the uh, folks in our community who were patient um, and waited around and commented. Uh, Mr. Atkins, I do wanna say thank you for your service to uh, the country um, that, that um, is impressive and, and um, we, we all wanna thank you for that. Um, you have worked with uh, planning staff, you've worked with the plan commission, and um, I'm just going to offer some, uh, some thoughts based on what I was thinking before, but also um, just in response to things I've heard today as well. So um, first of all, regarding uh, the stormwater, I think it would be beneficial to get drainage basins here. It would help all the neighbors. Um, and But is that worth the cost of a development that is going to make that drainage even more difficult to manage? Because as soon as you take out mature trees, you're changing the runoff. Um, you put in roads, you put in rooftops, you're changing the runoff. And that's all calculated by the drainage, uh, uh, sorry, by the stormwater um, department. But the problem is um, this is a huge project uh, in terms of the stormwater. And as been noted, HOAs have been difficult for us. Um, and it, in addition to trying to manage stormwater, um, I also see this uh, hydrants, which, you know, um, that's a cost. Um, and I also see... Um, there was a discussion of opening the park to uh, the public. Well, that's a, a beautiful gesture. That is going to be a, a huge insurance uh, bill for liability. Um, and we don't know what that cost is going to be. Um, it's important to note that the Historic Preservation Board has made a note on this and has um, written a letter in opposition to this petition. Um, and it's not just the 18, what was it, um, Commissioner Giffen's 1899 barn. Uh, we were, we, um, uh, she had mentioned yesterday that um, she had looked at the assessor's records, which I don't usually do, um, but I'm going to. <laughs> so I always learn something new from my colleagues too. Um, so that the barn's already gone. Um, we don't have a stop demolition process um, uh, in our ordinances. Um, and, um, you know, there's the house that was remodeled, but the original house is from that same era. There are outbuildings, there's dry fence. Um, this is a, uh, at least a contributing um, scenario. Um, and we don't have very many houses and outbuildings and fencing from this era. And the fact that it just kind of didn't ever really get addressed um, is, is too bad. Um, I do agree with Commissioner Jones that, well, one of the things that I know is that no matter what we do, people are gonna be angry with us. They're gonna be mad at us. Uh, this is what we signed up for. Um, and it's tough to make these decisions because they are difficult. I can see that it would be beneficial to the whole area to have better drainage here. But <laughs> there's um, a cost to that um, that comes in many forms. Um, I, what I tend to do is I tend to think 20 years from now, if I'm lucky enough to still be here, I drive by this or I see this, am I gonna be proud of saying yes to this. And I can't say that I would be because I know what's there before. Um, and it's important to think about where this is at in terms of the roads. Do you know, we talked a lot about dollars and HOA costs and these three very expensive things that the HOA would be taking on in addition to other um, ongoing maintenance issues. Um, that's a cost that's borne by the homeowners, not the developer. Uh, the developers agreed and offered to put in some a fund together. That's great. But there's still a lot of ongoing costs beyond five years, 10 years, 15 years. But numbers matter for traffic too. And I will say that even if we can look at a range of um, 
the traffic counts. And if we see there's currently a daily trips of um, 1,132, then um, we can either add in 1,250 more trips a day to 1,350 trips per day, depending on which numbers you want to use. And what you end up with, no matter what, is 100% increase in traffic. Not, not, and this is not just the construction time phase. This is ongoing. It's, it's about um, buses and UPS trucks and commuters and parents dropping off and everything else. Um, I'm not comfortable with that. And I think we could expand Victor Pike, uh, but who's going to pay for that? The Monroe County taxpayers are going to pay for that. And I'm not sure that it's fair to saddle them with this. Um, I am um, concerned about the one, one street access. And one of the things I think about this, I think that overall, this is a good plan, but I just don't think this is the right place for it. So for example, if this, if this plan were picked up and dropped somewhere else with um, a much more compatible street uh, scenario, like for example, Fullerton Pike, especially once it gets finished, I would, I would support this because it's on a larger uh, thoroughfare, it is um, still in close proximity to things like schools and whatnot, but this, this roadway and is, is not really quite developed for this. Um, I would also say that the comp plan, everybody's talking about the comp plan, and I don't, I don't, I, and, I, and I believe it was unintentional, but I don't appreciate having things put in a paper in an advertisement. We can't do anything about it. That's not, that, aren't, that is not true. And it, and it sends people into um, arguing for or against things without the facts. And so I don't believe that was an intentional thing, but I hope that people understand that what was in the paper regarding pricing um, may not have been accurate. Um, pricing is attainable. Housing, if you're a millionaire, you can attain housing. And if you make you know, $100,000 a year for your family, you can attain housing. Attain is an interesting word. Uh, we don't use, uh, we don't have a system um, for uh, affordability, to assess affordability, to require affordability in our current code. And I don't know if that's where we're going to go as we do the CDO. It may be and it may not be. I think there are pros and cons. Um, and $300,000, $400,000 as a target. That is great. You have a target. We can't hold you to it. I would never want to hold you to it. I don't think it would be fair to you. And I don't think it's fair to the community either. I wish we would stop talking about housing prices and housing affordability or attainability because we don't have an agreement on terms. We don't have a good database of what is there. Um, and that's something we need to work on in the county, and that's our responsibility, and I know that that work is already underway. What housing do we have? What's being built? Um, you know, and, and we, we look at these realtors' numbers, and we use them as gospel, and we don't have our own numbers, and we need that. Um, we can't count. Can we count student apartments as housing? Because really, there are only so many people in the community who are going to want to rent an apartment by a room with its own lock right next to campus. Um, I, you know, I, those are big questions that we need to address. Um, and the other thing I want to say about the newspaper ad is that the part that was included is the picture of the park. If folks want another park in this area, that's fine, but that's not what that's not what this plan is for. This plan is not to develop a park. This is a plan to develop a housing um, subdivision. And I really like what Commissioner Jones said. I think you know the cookie cutter look of of same builder, three different designs, four different elevations, three colors, two stones. It all looks the same. And I really like the idea of trying to get back to something where we can where we can um, get lots going and, and allow people to build as they can afford to build. Um, and uh, unfortunately, one of the things that makes lots very expensive is sewers and roads. And um, 
the sewer issue comes into play as soon as your acreage is under one. Um, so um, I, I really hope we don't get into anecdotal evidence again about we need housing, we don't need housing. Well, this is affordable, this isn't. We don't have the data um, and it's something that we need to work on. The other thing I think we need to work on is as we go through the CDO, I spoke with Lisa Ridge about this yesterday, I would really like us to reopen the thoroughfare plan and take a real hard look at it um, in light of the CDO and really think about um, what John taught me <laughs> is this idea of road sheds. Um, is the road large enough for this kind of development? It's such a good way to think about planning. If it's not, then do we need to think about, we need to think about what roads are going to get larger and, and focus our development there. Um, and so I think that's going to be um, a real guiding force. Uh, so again, um, last thing, numbers matter. Um, in, in the total of the whole property, including the roadways and the utility area that's blocked out, um, we have um, 2.8 lots per acre, if you use that 44 acre now. Now, if you look only at the developable non-roadway, non-utility numbers, you are now putting five homes per acre on the remaining land. And that looks different than 2.8 lots per acre. You're now at five lots per acre, right? And so it's, it, I think we always have to think about both of those numbers. They're both true, they're both true, but I think we do need to, to look at both of those numbers. Um, and I appreciate everybody who has um, taken the time to write or call about this issue. We've heard from a lot of folks. Um, and um, again, we appreciate um, this, uh, effort in this work, I just wish it were somewhere else. I just wish it were somewhere else because it's um, it's thoughtful, especially in terms of the park and the amenities, but I just don't think this belongs here. It just doesn't feel right. It doesn't sit well. And uh, sometimes you just have to say, what's this gonna be in 20, 25 years and, and make, a, make a tough decision. And these are tough, tough decisions that we're making. We do not take them lightly. We spend a lot of time reading and deliberating and thinking and um, working through in our minds with our constituents what, what the future of the community is going to look like. And so part of this is about timing because we don't have a CDO. And, and so that may be an issue you may want to wait. Um, and part of this is, is really just about um, us getting a better sense of the housing market as it is today. Um, and really understanding it, not from a, a realtor's um, consultant's uh, guidebook. So, sorry, I droned on. Um, I did write down a lot of notes. Uh, <laughs> so I appreciate everyone. Uh, I appreciate everyone's attention. And I would, um, if it's okay with my colleagues, I would like to go ahead and uh, are we a vote. Yes, yes, okay. Uh, Mr. Cockrell, um, would you please call the roll on Ordinance 2021-36? Uh, Thomas. Thomas. No. Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Jones, you're muted. No. <laughs> Commissioner Giffins. No. Uh, motion is denied, zero three. Right. Thank you so much. Um, again, we appreciate everybody's patience. Um, um, we don't have uh, any appointments today, but I will remind everybody uh, that we do. Uh, we have worked with the county council to provide the township assistance fund for folks who are in need in the community. Uh, every resident of the county lives in a township. And if you need assistance, please contact your trustee. Uh, they could be, be reached through 211 or 211in.org. Um, we are looking for uh, applicants for our boards and commissions, and especially redistricting. Uh, this may be our for that. Um, so we're looking uh, to build a balanced um, commission uh, committee to uh, work on the issues of redistricting. It will be a short-term uh, commitment, but it will be um, intensive 
because we are um, awaiting those census numbers uh, any minute. And as soon as we have them, um, the work has to be done um, in the next couple of months. So if you're interested in uh, precincts and um, council districts, commissioner districts, um, please apply. Um, and just a reminder as well, for our community, we do have office hours. Um, and those office hours are available on our calendar at co.monroe.in.us. You will find them um, four weeks of the month. You will find <laughs> at least one time during the day or the evening uh, when you can meet with one of us one-on-one -on -one and share your ideas or your concerns or whatever it is. Um, we're here for you and uh, we're doing this over Zoom in order to keep everyone safe. Um, and just a reminder that the next CDO meeting, um, talking about specifically about zoning, is Thursday, 5.30 via Zoom. And that's also, the link for that is also available through the calendar at co.monroe.in.us. Um, anything else from my colleagues? Okay, so we're going to come back um, at, is two o'clock good or do you need more time? Two o'clock is good. Okay. Uh, we're going to return at two o'clock. I have an appointment. I really thought I made it so it'd be late enough. Um, I have an appointment, so I will not be here, but the remaining members of the great board of commissioners will uh, will um, have uh, the work session beginning at uh, 2 p.m. And again, thank you everyone for your time and attention. And um, with that, we are adjourned. Thanks. Thank you.